um, outside the US, there are XPREL implementations for lots of different types of reporting entities, including uh, businesses reporting to securities and tax regulators, banking authorities, but also government entities. And in fact, one of the biggest non-US non XPREL implementations is in Australia, where both businesses and governments report in XPREL format. This program alone is estimated to be saving the Australian government um, and businesses $1.1 billion a year. So you can imagine what that would translate to in the United States. But in the US, the concept for XBRL for state and local and government reporting is not new. Um, at about the same time that the SEC mandated XBRL for operating companies, the MSRB was actually the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board was looking into the idea of electronic reporting for municipalities. Um, at the time that they introduced EMMA, which was their electronic municipal market access system, um, they noted in a, a release that was published about EMMA, they said that they support the SEC's interactive data and XPRL initiatives for registered offerings and would consider designating XPRL as an electronic format for purposes of submissions to the EMMA Primary Market Disclosure Service at such time in the future as appropriate taxonomies for the municipal marketplace have been developed and as issuers begin the process of producing primary market disclosure documents using XBRL. So that was pretty, a pretty telling statement. And we really believe that that time has now come. Um, we're beginning to see a lot of interest at the government level. Um, last year, I think we're all aware that the state of Florida uh, made a, a very big move legislating the use of XBRL for state and local reporting. And now um, a, a somewhat similar uh, piece of legislation has been introduced in California, and we expect that to move forward. We had good news yesterday that it passed through a second committee. So those actions, along with recent technology developments in the XPRL um, specification and the increasing use of standards worldwide um, have really prompted the creation of a committee at XPRL US called the State and Local Working Group. And I wanna thank the, the XPRL US State and Local Working Group. Many of, many of you are here today for the tremendous work that you've done. Um, this group has built multiple releases of a taxonomy to represent the CAFR statement. The group is led by Mark Jaffe from the Reason Foundation. He chairs the working group and he's been really instrumental in moving the whole project forward. Other people involved are Shannon Soul with, uh, from Northern Illinois University, who's been one of our key subject matter experts and actually led a group of subject matter experts in building the CAFR. We've gotten technical expertise from Dean Ritz and Kathleen Coons at Workiva, who built an initial release of the taxonomy. And we're now working with Anand Padmanavan and his team at IRIS in a second release of the taxonomy. We've also gotten a lot of support from uh, Srini Murdy at EZXBRL and his team, and many others who I, I, I can't even name all of the, the people that are involved in this working group. So this group has built a draft taxonomy they have uh, engaged additional subject matter experts and taxonomy experts and software providers, and they've really gotten momentum going on what we see as an incredibly important project. Um, and they have been tireless in their efforts to get the message out about what we're doing. So this forum today is more evidence of that work. So we've got some really great speakers today, and I'm gonna turn it over to Mark Joffe because he's gonna introduce our first speaker, and I'm gonna bring slides up for that. Well, thanks everyone for uh, for coming. You know, um, for me, um, XBRL is uh, a means to an end rather than an end in itself. And the means is really to be able to get a hold of all the state and local government financial data for analysis for purposes of understanding relative credit risk, understanding uh, performance across uh, uh, the municipalities and states and so forth. So one of the things that um, I came across when I, I entered this area a few years ago is the fact that um, in the nonprofit space, the, um, uh, the academic community that handles the monitoring of, um, of uh, finances of um, organizations that are 501c3 or other 501c tax exempt, um, they just have a lot very strong community and a lot of data. And um, many of us who uh, go to conferences like uh, uh, ABFM have noted that there's a lot of work being done by the basically the same research community on nonprofits as there is for governments. So given the, 
the great success that uh, uh, we've seen in the nonprofit space with harvesting and using 990 data, I thought I would ask uh, Nathan Dietz, who's a senior member of that community, to join, to join us today and, and tell us about uh, the challenges and progress that's been made in harvesting nonprofit data. Um, I came across uh, Nathan through accessing the um, um, Urban Institute's uh, National Center for Charitable Statistics website. Um, the Urban Institute has a huge database of um, 990 disclosures um, in a very uh, user accessible form, a real model for what I hope will eventually happen for um, state and local government, where you'll just pump in a name and see all the information that you'd ever wanna know about that, um, uh, about that organization. Um, now Nathan is uh, with the Do Good Institute um, and you're at the University of uh, Maryland, right? College Park. Without further ado, turn it over to Nathan. Thank you. Um, is there a clicker or should I just advance the slides this way? That's probably, I think you might want to use that one. No. Oh. Yeah, got yeah. it. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark. Do you want one? Um, does it, yeah. Will it work? Yeah. Is this, is this Thank you. Sorry, I Uh, Does it go in here? It's a USB. Yeah, I thought it was USB. Oh, there's only one USB. Yeah. Oh, there's only one USB. Okay. Take the village. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Well, as Mark said, I think uh, I'm, I'm here to talk about what we have done in the, the community of uh, people who do research on nonprofit tax exempt organizations to make data from IRS Form 990 available for researchers, policymakers, uh, regulators, and uh, a lot of other interested audiences. I think by the end, you'll understand why I might qualify part of the title of my talk. I, I think we've been partially successful in making everything that. Uh, that, that we need to, to fully unlock the potential of electronically filed 990 tax returns. And uh, I think I only have some uh, lessons that people who work with other government data sources might be able to use in their own projects because we work with the IRS's exempt organizations division and uh, we faced a lot of challenges, I think, that are just due to the fact that IRS is under a lot of pressure. So, but I think uh, as Mark said, we do have an indirect, we do have a really involved community. We have a lot of uh, participation from many people who have made good use of the 990 data. And I, I want to give you just an overview of that just to set up some of the discussions about uh, what might happen in other contexts. Can you can people read this in the back? Okay, that's all right. I think uh, I can give you uh, I can give you broad overviews. Basically, uh, Form 990 is the is a generic title for the form like the 1040 form that nonprofit organizations file with financial information, some programmatic information, uh, but uh, a lot of information that you might find on, a, on another sort of audited financial statement. The largest tax exempt organizations have to fill out the full form 990 uh, unless, and, uh, unless they receive their, unless they're a private foundation, meaning that they receive their support from a small number of charitable donors, in which case they file the special form 990 PF uh, for private foundations. If you don't have uh, a budget or uh, annual income that reaches a certain level, $200,000 or more typically, or total assets greater than $500,000, you can file the for, uh, smaller form 990 EZ. If you have a very small organization, you don't even need to file the EZ, you can file what's called the e-postcard. Form 990N, which is just <laughs> name, rank, and serial number for organizations. So typically, these, all these forms have been filed on paper, with the exception of the e-postcard, which is fairly new 
and has always been filed electronically. The very largest organizations file their 990s electronically by law, and about 60% of the other organizations that file PFs, EZs, or the full 990s file their uh, returns electronically these days. So, uh, again, this is more history. I think uh, IRS has always made a lot of data available to researchers in the nonprofit field about uh, with financial data. And I just want to say a few words about some of the major releases that, uh, that they've been putting out. This is before the, the era of electronic filing. They, first of all, file kind of an encyclopedia or an annual uh, complete list of tax exempt organizations that they call the uh, business master file. It's all organizations that are tax exempt, regardless of whether they're 501c3s or other 501c's. And they don't have, there's not much data here. I think there are only three financial fields. It's mostly descriptive information about the organization, but it's complete and it's updated every year. So it's useful for uh, just a sense of what the sector looks like. Next, uh, IRS's exempt organizations division releases us uh, uh, some financial information for all the organizations that file tech, uh, 990s or 990 EZs. Um, and that's the basis for a lot of research that people do on nonprofit finance. The thing about the annual data extracts, what they call the return transaction files, is that IRS doesn't do a lot of work to clean or validate any of the, any of the data. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that they just dump uh, the data that's collected by IRS during a given year it can correspond to the current tax year. In a lot of cases, it corresponds to previous tax years, and you need to figure that out yourself. IRS has recently done a lot more uh, to make financial information available from Form 990. Uh, since 2012, they've expanded the number of variables, financial variables from each of the forms that are available uh, that gives us a lot more opportunity to look at financial information about Form 990 well over 60%, well, over 60% for all three forms. And uh, all that is available right now uh, without uh, whether or not the organization files its form electronically or not. And then finally, uh, the EO division releases a fully validated, fully clean data set for a randomly selected sample of 990 filers and 990EZ filers. It's stratified by size so that you do have a sense of, uh, so that you can talk about sector-wide finances. Uh, but again, you only have data for 31,000 organizations. So if you're interested in specific organizations, this is maybe not the data set for you. So as Mark said, uh, the, the data sets that are available through NCCS involve, uh, are, are all available, first of all, on the NCCS, uh, NCCS website nccs.urban.org. We have BMF, uh, complete lists of 990, of 990 filers uh, and easy filers. We have annual sample data sets. We have RTF extracts. We have what we've always called the core files, which is uh, NCCS's attempt to take the uh, annual RTF extracts and clean and validate the data so that it's useful for researchers. Uh, and uh, we've maintained those for 30 years now. I think uh, they're a couple years behind the times, but they're readily and freely available for everybody. We also have data for uh, a limited time period. It's pretty old by now, but it's called the digitized data because that is an attempt to uh, record all the information from Forms 990 uh, that were filed even uh, from paper forms. What NCCS did in partnership with GuideStar is key punch the data from the forms. That's the term that we used. and. Uh, that's a very time consuming way of getting the complete set of financial information. But NCCS also uh, makes trend analysis files available with core file data from, uh, from a, uh, a number of years. And it makes a master file available with descriptive information uh, about the organization. So we have all this financial information that's freely available. And so the question is, now that or nonprofit organizations are electronically filing their tax forms, what's the additional value that we can get from that? I think in a lot of cases, the, the value that uh, 
the, the really important fields that are located on the form that have never been part of IRS's data releases are in part three of the 990, which is statement of program services accomplishments. That section starts off with a description of the organization's mission and goes on to give the organization space to describe its primary program service accomplishments. And uh, it's just a description of what the nonprofit actually does. Uh, it's of course never been available because it doesn't fit into a spreadsheet easily, but it's maybe the only source of information about what the organization, what the organization has actually accomplished in its own words. So the prospect of using data from section three to talk about what nonprofit organizations actually does has been really attractive to people. And we've been awaiting uh, the release of electronically filed data from 990s for a long time because of uh, opportunities like this. So what we, uh, it, the main progress I think has been made toward uh, making 990 open and freely available has really come about in the last five years or so. In 2013, the Aspen Institute uh, published a report called Information for Impact that describes how uh, we could release data from uh, electronically filed form sign 90s, how we can promote uh, universal e-filing, and uh, what we can do when we have all this data. So uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is just based on the arguments that Novak and Goroff made in this report. Um, and, and a lot of what we thought what we think of as the promise of having open 990 data comes from uh, the arguments that they made here about how great it would be. In 2015, uh, a guy named Carl Malamud from publicresource.org sued the IRS, who has been collecting, which had been collecting e-file data for a, uh, several years by that point, and, or, and uh, trying, to, trying to force them to release it to the public. Uh, later that year, IRS did release data from nine uh, tax returns, exactly nine tax returns <laughs> to the public in electronic form. And, uh, and at that time, we all said, okay, well, I mean, they just, they, they lost the lawsuit. So uh, this is how they're complying with the decision. It doesn't really help anybody, but I guess now we just have to deal with the fact that we're never going to get what we want from the IRS. So completely out of the blue, in 2016, IRS announced that they were going to release the data that they had in by, uh, that was filed electronically in XML format. And we all went, no, no one really understood why or how that happened, uh, but we immediately went to work trying to figure out how to make sense of all the data and how to process it so that we, we could actually use it like we've been accustomed to do. In 2017, the Aspen Institute hosted what we called the first uh, uh, validatathon and uh, just a, a group of people getting together, trying to figure out how to, uh, trying to convert the XPass that we got from IRS so that we could process the data that was in XML format and create flat files that, that we could use. At that time, the, the main group of people who were involved in this work uh, sort of <laughs> consolidated our efforts and formed the nonprofit Open Data Collect uh, Collective. Mark's a member, I'm a member, and so are several people who were involved in this process you know, throughout uh, the early years of this, uh, this timeline. In the meantime, Aspen has been working with Congress to try to promote uh, mandatory e-filing for all 990 filers. And little by little, progress has been made in Congress. A couple of weeks ago, House, the House passed a bill that would make uh, e-filing mandatory. So eventually, we might get all the data that we've ever wanted from non 990 filing organizations uh, from the IRS for free, as long as we can figure out how to process it. Um, doing okay on time? Uh, I think you have about five minutes. That's, that's good. Okay. Well, I think the uh, this list of uh, of benefits of having open 990 data comes from uh, the the Novak Novak and Goroff report, and uh, it probably looks a lot like the the list of benefits that you have in mind when you think about what we could do with open uh, state and local financial data. We can talk about uh, programmatic expenditures sector-wide. We can talk about uh, uh, individual nonprofit leaders because there's information about that on every 990 form. Uh, we can check investment and program alignment for given organizations. More, And we can make valuable data 
easily available to regulators to help promote transparency and trust, which is at least as important to the nonprofit sector as it is to the public sector. Uh, we can monitor lobbying. We can facilitate these sort of validatathons that I was talking about earlier and other data mashups that, uh, that people might use to get the most out of the data. And this is last on most people's list, academic and business research. <laughs> but of course, it's near and dear to my heart. We want to make the best of, those of us who work in academics want to make the best use of the data that we can. So I think these, if these slides are going to be available, then I won't say very much about, uh, about these sources. Um, but there's been a lot of work by this collective to, uh, and other people who are involved in, this, uh, in the process of opening up 990 data that is freely available, GitHub pages, et cetera. Um, probably the place that has uh, the, the best, uh, most easily usable data on uh, from e-filed 990 forms is open990.org. It was David Borenstein, who used to work at Char Charity Navigator, who uh, started off his work from, this, from the point of view of converting everything from XML data into JSON that's stored in NoSQL databases. Now, he knows how to do this. I, I don't have much direct involvement with that, but you can get flat files from open990.org, but they're not free. <coughs> so what, what work do we have left to do? We have the community. We have the data released from IRS. Uh, we have a lot of people who have sunk a lot of time into putting uh, data sets together that people can use. David has uh, David and the, the people at Charity Navigator, er, Open990.org, have done a lot to talk about the processing issues that we've run into. All we get from IRS is just a list of XPass in the schema format, and uh, our job, first of all, is to translate the XPass back to the line items on the 990s. Uh, that's that can be done. That's not that hard. The challenge is that the XPass change format more often than the 990 actually does. So we need to figure out exactly what happened there. Uh, the taxonomy isn't great. I think in some cases there's, a, there's not the expected correspondence between the parent and child expats. So we need to figure out how to, how to make that right. Uh, in some cases we have really troubling issues like a field where the definition is different in the documentation than it is on the paper form. Makes you wonder whether or not the organizations filling out the form did it correctly. Um, so we work through those issues I think our biggest challenge, though, is figuring out how to how to get these questions, get our questions answered by the exempt organization division from IRS. Um, there, as you probably know, uh, under constant scrutiny, constant pressure, budgetary pressures, political pressures, we just have a hard time trying to uh, trying to figure out who to talk to within the EO division uh, who can answer our questions. Um, the latest issue that we've run into is we have we don't have schemas for the last couple of years, tax years. So we need to uh, find out how to get those. I mean, that's a without those, it's kind of hard to figure out just how to start the processing of uh, the latest IRS releases. And it's for that that's why I said at the beginning of the talk that I'm not quite sure exactly what lessons uh, you can draw from this if you're working with some other government agency. Um, if you don't run into these problems, then you're probably in better shape than we have been, even though we're trying our best to, to uh, get around the problems ourselves. We need help at some point from IRS to, uh, to, to get our questions answered. The biggest issue, and I'll conclude with this because it's from my point of view, we don't have data from paper returns, uh, complete data from paper returns, especially data that's been filed before the e-filing era started in the mid-2000s. That's a big problem for researchers like me. It's something that we're probably going to have to, to deal with, even if mandatory e-filing becomes law. We're still going to have to figure out how to deal with this backlog of paper returns, which has a lot of useful data that we just don't have access to now. But we have made some progress, as Mark said, and uh, we're going to keep on going. And hopefully there's, there are lessons here that can be useful for others. Time for maybe one, one or two questions. I'll jump in. <laughs> schema changes, I mean, are they, have they been happening very frequently or the fact that you don't have the schema? I, I think up until the time, up until 2016 or 2017, which I think is the last documented uh, occurrence of, of us getting the schema, they, the, 
the, the scheme has been changed pretty often. I think they changed at least once a year uh, for both the 990 and the 990Z form. So um, that's as much, and, and that's much more often than anybody expected. It seems like um, one of the things that really gave this group momentum was the involvement of the Aspen Institute. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little about that? Yes. Uh, yeah, Cynthia Schumann Ottinger at the at the Aspen Institute um, has been the, the I think deputy director of the uh, nonprofit and philanthropy unit within Aspen, and I think she's been working with uh, she's been working in this space for a long time trying to support the people who have been collecting and processing data that IRS has released in the past. That includes NCCS as well as GuideStar, uh, Charity Navigator, and the other organizations that you might whose names you might be familiar with. She's really done the work to uh, first keep pressure on government, which a lot of us in uh, nonprofit organizations have sometimes feel like we have a hard time doing since we're not really advocacy oriented, um, as well as getting people together just to, uh, to talk about the issues that we need to bring forward to IRS. And um, lately it's been bringing the, the data processing people together. So we, uh, it's hard to imagine where we'd be without her. Yeah. Um, Nathan, I was wondering, you showed that part three the description but um, how much, um, what is the, the importance or kind of the spread of, you know, what do you take from, from using from that actual form versus the schedules? You know, the information that, that you're taking, is it more important to get the numbers and the, the financial information or this additional information for all the schedules that you've published? Well, can you repeat the question? Because we have people on the on webcast as well. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, the question is, uh, why is it so important to get, I'm paraphrasing, so don't let, me, don't let me misstate something. Why is it so important to get data from Section 3, the program service accomplishments and the missions, as opposed to getting data from the schedules, which has detailed information about uh, just certain special circumstances that the organization might find themselves in, and a lot of extra financial information. Um, I think, first of all, we have uh, this, Section 3 is the only place where outside of section O, where it's just a, an additional section where people can continue discussions like this, section or schedule O. Section three is the only place where you can get information about the actual programs that the organization runs. Um, there are, uh, in IRS data releases, I think you do get some data from the schedules and uh, there's a lot of valuable information that we're able to get now from the schedules. Uh, Schedule J on compensation, Schedule N on dissolution and mergers, which I'm working with now for a research project, as well as many others. But information about what the organizations do, I think is people are really starting to latch onto this to, to learn more about what takes what the nonprofit sector actually does. Yeah. Is that a, um, you already talked about section or, or does that structured information? Is it, you're gonna do Processing process would need a natural language processing. You uh, for the for the description fields, you would need a, that that's tax, that's narrative, so you'd need to do natural language processing. There is information about uh, expenses and revenues associated with each activity, as well as grants uh, that are given out to support the activities, and uh, those are available in their own, those are in their own fields. Um, I think there's I think the data there are kind of spotty. I think that's that's another challenge is to try to figure out how to how to boost the quality of the, the data that people enter. Yeah. Is any organization have you considered uh, putting out a schema for the kinds of information that you want so that the nonprofits could actually just publish it on their web pages and then you can search for it's like the friends of a friend or other types of schema elements. Mm -hmm. So that would be uh, machine readable from their websites. When you're looking at things like, well, what are your activities? You would think every nonprofit would publish that, but it's not doing it in a structured form. Actually, uh, that's, I think, what guides, uh, that's the, the motivation behind GuideStar's uh, nonprofit profiles. You know, they, they do encourage people to, to put in information in a, in a systematic way in their, in their profiles. Um, the, the trick for most of the rest of us is to, is to, to get access to the data. <laughs> Well, that, that would see something would be available on your website since every nonprofit also probably has a website. You know, it, it's it's creating uh, the possibility for uh, automated mining mm -hmm. of those fields and knowing what they are, 
they're not having ambiguity because they're all using the same schema to describe services, et cetera. Yeah. That would be independent of the IRS. Yeah. I, you know, I think that could work if, uh, I think the, the challenge is to promote take up among uh, individual organizations to put the, put it on their web pages. Well, some of the places like they're talking about Charity, Nav Charity Navigator and others, if you want visibility, then you have to have a, a modest amount of transparency. So there, you know, participation benefit that yeah. comes about. It's just an alternative rather than always looking towards the the IRS or someone else to say these are the fields, the mandated fields. You can have a, the best of the best anarchy with the self-organization. Yeah. The researchers has helped organize what the schema might be and work with Charity Navigator and others to say if you have it, we'll pull the data out of there. You won't have to do a survey from us. Yeah. I think that, I think at this point, given the, the fact that the Charity Navigator and GuideServe have been at this for a while, the, the trick is to get them to, to be willing to share their data with the larger community. So. Okay, well, thank you very, thank you. Thanks very much, John. Can I, can, I, can I leave it here? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, David. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. And our next speaker is uh, Stephen Owens. Uh, Stephen has been with the Census of Governments and related programs for several years. He served in several leadership positions, including recent efforts to transition the program to 100% electronic collection and increased, yes, <laughs> and, and he has increased the use of administrative records. His specializations include state and local government structure, tax law, education, and criminal justice statistics, and fiscal federalism. So we're very happy to have Steve here, and um, he is a, a big part of our working group as well. Okay, thank, thanks for having me. Um, the Bureau, as you know, has been all over the news the last couple of days. I'm not going to get too much into that other than to say that uh, we are prepared to go either way, whichever way the court decides, which they're going to decide in June, we've got contingency plans either way. It should really affect operations. And the other thing I wanted to say is I want to kind of debunk a myth. Um, the Bureau really does take privacy seriously. In fact, um, so seriously that I had sent Mark at one point an email with uh, some sample financial data uh, that we were passing back and forth, and it didn't get to Mark immediately. It got intercepted by our privacy cops who basically said, well, you know, you're sending out potential PII data and it's not encrypted and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I said, oh, really? Uh, can you tell me where the PII is? And, and they're like, oh, no, not that joker with this program. And they finally let it through. But we do take it seriously. <laughs> um, but most people, when uh, I tell them I work for the Census Bureau, ask me what I do for the other nine years. And I just kind of roll my eyes at them. And <laughs> what, what, a lot of, what a lot of people don't realize is that the Census Bureau actually has three censuses. The population census, which everybody knows about, please answer when it comes up a year from now. Uh, save yourself and the taxpayers' money. Uh, the economic census, which is essentially, uh, some of you may have used the data, it's a census of non-agricultural businesses. And then there's a census of governments. We're actually the baby of the bunch. We were uh, authorized by Congress in 1950. Uh, the census is conducted every five years, the years ending in two and seven. Uh, in 1952, Congress forgot to fund it, so the first modern-day census governments was done in 1957, and we've been doing it every year ever since. And in addition to the census, we also run annual surveys in the intervening years with pretty much exactly the same content. Um, you know, why do we care about uh, local government financial reporting? Well, one of, probably our, our flagship program is our general finance survey, which is a survey of state and local government finances. Uh, we also do some specializations with public pensions. It was uh, good to see the EU standards come out on that a month or two ago. Uh, special focus on taxes and some public employment data as well. We, uh, we basically collect four major financial categories of, of um, government finance data, namely assets, debt, expenditure, and revenue. Um, when, when, uh, Mark first approached me on this, we were actually working on a project and, um, Mark was introduced to us by one of our longtime data users where Mark was out there doing some web scraping and crawling of CAFRs. We had kind of our own internal effort doing web, web scraping and crawling, which was uh, kind of our new cutting edge technology of the Bureau. And, um, I was desperately at the time trying to um, somewhat kill it on our end because 
Uh, I recognize the difficulty of, um, you know, doing the, the web crawling and scraping for CAFRs and actually getting something meaningful out of it on a massive basis was a bit futile. Um, unfortunately, I had a colleague who didn't feel that way and just wanted to put her feather in a cap and was just pushing, pushing, pushing. She is thankfully since retired. But, the, but we actually have found a use for web crawling and scraping. Um, and this is something that all of you can kind of think about. Uh, we do some tax surveys. And we generally use um, numbers that states put up on their websites just on canned reports. And what we found is we can take, we can web scrape and scroll these, uh, web scrape and crawl these reports, which essentially never change in format, and pretty much automate a survey collection doing that. But that's because the states, it's one respondent per state, and it stays consistent the whole time. Um, our first exposure to XBRL was actually back in 2008. We have a seat on the, um, uh, the advisory committee, the GASB, um, Government Accounting Standards Advisory Committee, and we were made aware of the uh, whole Oregon experiment in 2008. We were all over that. We were like, hey, this is this would be great. This could save us a lot of money. And Oregon proved out the concept, but it just kind of died from there. Um, and there are probably a lot of reasons for that. A lot of you are probably um, somewhat acquainted with that. And through our representation on GASAC, we, we've continually tried to push this to the top of GASB's research agenda. However, all the differing interests in GASB, that may not be at the top of everybody's list. And, and frankly, GASB is not a regulating body. They don't have the teeth to do this. All they can kind of do is recommend. But uh, it, it still is on their research agenda. They're monitoring it, but um, you know, that, that's about where that stops. I almost started this presentation off with the phrase, welcome to my 10th amendment hell. And I think a lot of you face that when you're trying to get state and local governments because the 10th amendment prohibits the federal government from going through and mandating anything on state and local government uh, governments that isn't specifically or implicitly or explicitly stated in the constitution. And certainly government financial data is not one of those. We, um, what we found is we generally have more success when you have a carrot and a stick approach. So when there's some federal funding tied to something, for example, you're much more likely to get cooperation. You can actually start mandating uh, reporting uh, methods to state and local governments. And I've seen it work in a number of places. We actually run the single audit program out of census, which many of you may be familiar with. It's certainly working there. And I, I've seen it work with uh, a lot of the education studies I, I worked on as well. Unfortunately, there really isn't a program like that right now. We used to be involved in a um, program called Federal Revenue Sharing, which was a um, basically kind of a uh, fiscal federalism um, pass through grants from the federal government to states based on a formula back in the 70s and 80s. And we actually administered that program. And when we did that, our response rates were through the roof because there was actually money in it for the governments if they responded and if they didn't respond. It, we put them on a list and their funding was in danger. So it worked really well. So, you know, right now there's no program like that, but if something comes along, that's, that's definitely something to jump on. So how do we actually get these data? You know, I always thought um, that our real value to the data use, user community wasn't so much in collecting state and local government uh, financial data, but it wasn't standardizing it. For example, you know, what Illinois may call a fee, New Hampshire may call a tax. Well, what is it? And then we put out data that can be compared across states and you know you're comparing apples to apples essentially. But uh, in, in go, working through some of this project and with others, I realized that, hey, there's, there's a lot of value in the collection. We spend a lot of money on data collection, a disproportionate amount. I'd, I'd much rather, one of the things I told Mark was, please put me out of the data collection business. We, you know, I, I'd much rather spend our time analyzing the data, putting out better statistics, more accurate, usable statistics. But the reality of it is we spend a lot of time collecting data. So how do we do it? Well, the Bureau as, as a whole has made it clear that um, we want to get away as much as possible from directly asking respondents for, for, for data. Uh, they want to go much more towards the administrative record end, and they're supporting big data efforts and, and things like that. It makes a lot of sense. Why go after data from the source when it's already being collected somewhere else, and, and it's good or almost as good, and you can use it that way? Unfortunately, in the state and local government world, um, that's not always possible. 
So one of our uh, direct canvas methods is we send the government an online questionnaire, ask them to fill it out. They send it back. We convert it into an XML format, it go, which is fairly efficient. It goes into our database and our analysts can start working with it. Unfortunately, only about 5% of our data come in that way. Now, if you were to ask me how much of our collection budget we spent to try to get that 5% of the data, it's way more than 5%. Very inefficient method. The other problem with going straight to the state and local governments, well, we don't go straight to states, I'll get into that in a minute. But the other problem with going straight to local governments to ask them for the data is you're gonna get thousands of different interpretations of what we're asking for. And the nice thing about a CAFR is you've got a document that's been through an auditor. It is an official document from the government. It's probably your first exposure to quote unquote usable data. Because a lot of the data that come in through the online method where a government fills it out. We just have to do a lot of cleanup. Um, second method from direct canvas, they don't fill out the questionnaire. They say, don't bother us. We're giving you a CAF or use our CAF. Wow. <laughs> the third method is they don't respond to us, to us at all and tell us to go to 10th Amendment Hill. If I had a dollar for every time I heard, if it's not required by law, um, anyway. So uh, in, in the latter case, we then are forced to either find a CAFR for them, or if they're insignificant, we'll impute their data and, and more or less make it up. Um, when they send us a CAFR, it has to be looked at by an analyst. They have to go through and code it. It's a lot of manual labor because now essentially we're saying, okay, go in. Yes, this is an administrative record, but it's an extremely labor intensive record. Um, Second method we use is procurement of administrative records. And we do this in two ways. And I think one of these ways is what's going to hold a lot of hope for the effort of this working group. You know, you talk about the Floridas and the Californias. So we have arrangements primarily with state and large local governments where we get their financial data centrally through them. And generally what that consists of is, is one of two things. So with the state governments, the only thing better than a CAFR is the source data that were actually used to make the CAFR. And what we do with the state government, since the CAFRs generally don't connect, uh, contain enough detail for our statistics, is we go through and say, give us a dump of your financials. And they literally, you know, give us your, you know, your, your funds, your objects, et cetera. And we get that data from them and, and we essentially code, code that up ourselves. And that's for um, ma mainly the expenditure and the revenue data. And the states are fairly consistent with that. You know, every year or so, uh, one state may change their accounting system, but we can deal with that and, and we can process that fairly efficiently. Um, the other arrangements we have are with some states, such as Florida and California, they have, uh, for whatever reason and through whatever office, it's usually a state auditor, or state treasurer, some such official, um, some sort of uh, collection for their local governments. And so Florida and California are great examples because they collect data from all types of local governments, including their special districts, which you don't see in a lot of states. And it's great for us because they're doing the work for us. In some states, we have joint arrangements. California is one of those where we ask a few questions on their form. Uh, sometimes money is exchanged, sometimes it's not, sometimes services are exchanged, but these things work out fairly well. The data can be a very good quality, depending on the state's angle for use of this data. Some states use the data primarily to as a starting point for local governments to do their audits. Those data aren't so clean. Some states actually use it as the data that the um, locals use to, to produce their audits, then it tends to be very clean. Uh, California is a great example of that. We've Often California would hold up our releases because they spend so much time cleaning their data. So, um, that's really kind of primarily how we get the administrative records. Um, then we use other means, you know, such as, uh, you know, web scraping, big data, et cetera. But the problem with big data, and we just recently got the emergence file, is that it's great, but it's, it's kind of from a tertiary source. It's not always updated um, as accurately and as frequently as we like, and it excludes some things we're looking for, like bank loans, private placements, um, you know, just other things. So it's kind of an incomplete source. But but still usable. Um, I wouldn't doubt it. Um, what, what we've actually, what we quickly explain what Mergence is. Oh, Mergence is, um, they put out a, uh, a municipal debt database, which contains, at least they claim every municipal bond ever issued. Um, and they 
um, they release, you know, the amortization, what's what's still owed on it, the terms of the debt, that sort of thing. And we've had kind of mixed results from that. Um, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if they were doing something like that. What we've really found it useful for is two things for us, new bond issues, which they seem to be fairly accurate on. And the other thing is our, our actual frame. You get a lot of these uh, special districts that are just issuing debt and we wouldn't necessarily find them through conventional means. And hey, all of a sudden, and then you get into states like New York who play a shell game with their debt and create these corporations ad infinitum. But it really kind of works well for that. As far as debt statistics go, it doesn't do much for us if we want to measure a government's total outstanding debt, for example, just because of the, the problems with the data set, both with the accuracy and the exclusions uh, that, that it does have. Um, now, how do we, how do, once we get the data, how do we ingest it? And this is where XBRL could really help the Census Bureau. So I mentioned before that um, when, when a respondent, a government directly responds, we put their web response into an XML format, transfer it into our um, system, that's fine. The CAFRs, we manually code them, we manually key them uh, and key them into a processing system, very labor intensive, open to all sorts of type mistakes. Um, you know, you start introducing human error anytime you're doing that. And then we have uh, our other administrative data, such as those that were given to us by the states or, say, Florida or California. And the, the nice thing about that is the state generally keeps its format consistent over the years, but you still have to develop crosswalks for all of these states. And you have to say, OK, how can we get their data into our system? And that brings me to, to Mr. H. We have, we have an employee on staff who I'll call Mr. H. <laughs> Mr. H, if you can imagine, is kind of a cross between Mr. Spark, Spock and Mr. Sulu. Um, he mostly acts like Mr. Spock, but occasionally, uh, occasionally he'll do something impulsive like Sulu. And when he, does, when he does something impulsive, you know there's something vastly wrong with something we're doing in the organization. It's been absolutely fascinating. Mr. H has made a career out of doing uh, data conversion and data manipulation. He's an absolute expert at it. He can do it in his sleep. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. H, a couple of things with Mr. H. He's, uh, I think sometimes we take him for granted. He is not an analyst. He couldn't tell you the difference between a property tax and thumb tax. And the other thing with Mr. H is he's getting near retirement age. And when Mr. H retires, it leaves a void in, in, the, the learning he's done, the specialization he's accumulated over the years is not something you can easily replace off the street. So if you just had one taxonomy and we just had to write one translation, it would be primarily simple, uh, you know, a lot simpler and we wouldn't, uh, you know, we wouldn't miss Mr. H that much in his retirement. I'm betting Mr. H retires first, but we'll see. <laughs> it's kind of up in the air. Um, I also wanted to say that, uh, you know, I think I, I like what the group's doing with CAFRs. I think the CAFR focus is a good one, even though it doesn't meet our needs in every case. You're, you really are, and I'll reiterate this, getting an official document from the government um, that is really probably the most accurate thing you're going to get at probably the first opportunity with the resources you have. And, and honestly, with the GASB standardization, I think that can go really well hand in hand. And as you, you know, I've, I've seen the taxonomy that's being developed. Um, and I think you're on the right track with that, you know, just kind of doing it schedule by schedule. We'd love to see it done with pensions. Uh, you know, a lot of the GASB 67 and 68 statements. If we had that in XBRL format, it would make our collection job so much easier. Um, and we wouldn't have to put as much of a burden on ourselves in, in some cases, state pension systems. So. Um, uh, you know, again, this is anything that saves us money, saves you money because it saves taxpayer money. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fully in support of this effort. Anyone have any questions? Thank you. Oh, sure. That's a question about the F-28 used to collect some disinformation. How frequently do you update those, um, Concepts. So um, the, how can I put this? Um, the, the infrastructure of the Bureau moves kind of like the Titanic. Um, we, are, we are looking at doing a content review uh, for our 2022 census. And I expect we're gonna do a lot of streamlining. The F-28 form she mentions is this immense 
20 page form that we send out to even the smallest local governments and then we wonder why we have response problems. Um, is that lot, the one that gets the five percent response rate? Yeah, well that in, in a couple of the smaller ones, but that that really that that actually probably is less than five percent response. But that's I mean we have three forms. The two the two others go to kind of single smaller agencies, single function agencies, that type of thing. And they're generally two, three pagers. We're, we're also looking into doing like, um, we do have the technology to do dynamic questionnaire generation. So that if you send uh, something like that to a township in South Dakota, it only asks them about roads and cemeteries and doesn't ask them how much they're um, giving to the state for ports, you know, things like that that just don't exist. But I, I think ultimately, um, you know, that's also labor incentives to do that and customize things. So ultimately the solution really is to phase this out and go, you know, hundred percent administrative records on this stuff. Yeah. Um, I was curious, I think you, have a, you mentioned a list of every state local government, right? So right. Presumably you want to map all the data back to that list. Mm -hmm. Your merging tells you there was a school bond issue in North Dakota. How do you map that back to your district in North Dakota? I'll sell it to you. Um, no, I, no, I'm serious. So th there's a long backstory, which I could have a side conversation with you on this. But um, we have crosswalked because when, and I'm actually in the process of doing it now. I'm not quite finished or almost finished. We have uh, crosswalked the QCIP route, the six digit QCIP, to our own identifiers. So that's essentially how we were able to do that. It was kind of a, it's kind of a one time labor intensive process. And as far as maintaining the file and getting new governments, it's great because now you've got that QCIP crosswalk. So when you download emergence a few months later, you mash it up and you say, oh, here's some new stuff that we don't have. And, you know, there you go. Uh, that's what I'd have to have a side conversation with you on. Um, we were actually prohibited from doing it in 1994 by our legal office saying that, uh, well, you know, technically your data are publicly FOIAable, so you can't do that because it's proprietary. And I certainly have not put any of that in a public place. Um, but that would that would be something we have to run by our legal area before I could say whether or not we can publicly re release that. Um, I could certainly see doing something like a QCIP FIPS comparison or something like that. But um, it's interesting to know there's a demand for that, and that's that's something I can definitely run by legal, and maybe they'll slap me on the wrist for doing it in the first place. But <laughs> you got to get to work done. Sure. When you talk about administrative records, because Illinois worked with the uh, controller there. Yeah. The as far as I understand, local governments were self-reporting, um, you know, from their CAFR. Yeah. And, and we found, especially in the Cook County. Um, we also work with the Cook County Treasurer. Is those government entities, the data was so bad that we just went ahead and started collecting them ourselves. And and you will and you will find that. And that's why now Illinois is kind of in the middle on this. And that's why, you know, what what does the state use the data for and how clean is it? And that's something we're aware of on a state by state basis. So for example, Illinois, we know that's going to require more hands-on on our part than in some other states. And we do. You know, we do a whole slew of edits on these data just to make sure. And guess what? Our fallback is off on a CAFR, you know, for, for verifying it. Thank you Our next speaker is Mark Joffe. And uh, Mark, I think everybody knows him. He is a senior policy analyst at the Reason Foundation. Um, and he's also the chair of this committee that we've, we've all been, been referencing. Um, Mark has had a long career in the financial industry, including a senior director role at Moody's Analytics. And his, his research now focuses on sovereign and sub-sovereign credit risk and fiscal sustainability. Um, his financial research has been, has been published by the California State Treasurer's Office, UC Berkeley, the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, and the McDonnell Laurier uh, Institute, among, among others. So with that, I want to turn it over to Mark, who's going to talk about some of the work that we've been doing over the past uh, couple of months. We're just, we're just doing the, uh, the screen change right now. So this will just take a minute. OK, so can I just choose my desktop? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. We got some feedback, event feedback there. <laughs> <laughs> So we're trying to we're trying to make sure that people who are remote can see this also. So yeah. just please give us one second here. Is that what you want to be? No, I want to. I, okay. I, so is there, is there, so is there a way of suppress, suppressing this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how to move this thing. No, we want to keep the share going. We just yeah. don't want this. We don't want this control panel. Oh, oh there we go. Oh, there, okay. okay. You just have to let yeah, it perfect. Pop okay. Pop up there. All right. Okay. All right. So. Um, uh, what I want to do is I want to show you some of the uh, outputs from um, uh, from our working group. Um, let me just start by uh, um, you know addressing I think some concerns about what we're trying to do. So um, as uh, we've rolled out the concept of uh, introducing XBRL for um, comprehensive annual financial reports, uh, a lot of folks in the community of statement preparers have expressed some concern that. Um, that this is going to be a very costly and complicated to implement mandate, and that um, uh, a particular technology is being suggested, and that that technology may be suboptimal, and there may be better technologies um, to use. And I think, um, you know, a lot of that, a lot of those concerns are due to the um, initial rollout of XBRL um, for uh, publicly listed companies back in 2008. At that time, um, uh, the type of XBRL or the flavor of XBRL that was implemented was based on extensible markup language or XML, which is not um, a human readable um, way of presenting data. But in 2011, um, XBRL International introduced what's called inline XBRL. And all inline XBRL is, is a web page <coughs> with markup. And so what I want to show you today is some examples that uh, the working group has produced that are all in inline XBRL. And there's really no need really for an, um, a new sector like state and local government to embrace legacy XBRL because inline XBRL has been uh, developed. Key advantage of, of um, inline XBRL is that there's no need for multiple presentations. One presentation can take care of both the data uh, for uh, you know, automatically assimilating the information into a, a, a relational database, as well as the, um, the visual presentation. And because we're using HTML for the visual presentation, we can do a lot of things that are a lot more attractive than um, you can do with a standard PDF <laughs> document. So what we're looking at right now is a city in Northern California, um, not far from where I live called um, Orinda. And uh, this is their CAFR. So uh, if I go back to, um, uh, to here, to the PDF reader, you can see that um, this is an extract of the same um, document. This is just the CAFR that I downloaded from um, Arinda's website. Um, cities have really become fantastic about posting their CAFRs. It's becoming easier and easier. Just go to a city's website and, um, and find them. This, this took no time at all um, to locate. But let's say I want to now, you know, work with some of the data on this CAFR. Um, so if I, I think I was around page 40. 20, I think it was page 40 where I was before. 42. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so we look here um, and you can see it pretty well, I think. You can see that the balance sheet is um, divided up into two pages, right? And this page is really very <coughs> not user-friendly. Okay, and it's very difficult to work with this kind of information. So let's say, for example, I want to copy and paste it into, um, into Excel. So we'll go down there. So we've got that whole uh, statement now. So I do a control C, open up my Excel, um, set up a new sheet here, and then we do a paste. And you can see it doesn't really come in any kind of usable format. This, this document that I have actually has some pages that are scanned and the scans yield absolutely no data um, whatsoever. But now what about my um, inline XBRL example, which I, I was showing you? First of all, I have this nice navigation bar. And again, this is just the type of thing that HTML brings to the table. So uh, it would be a matter of um, uh, you know, cities working with vendors and saying, hey, you know, we really want this kind of nice um, presentation from you. 
So here's that balance sheet again. Now here you can see wonders of HTML, we've been able to put all the columns onto one, onto one sheet. So this now becomes a lot easier to work with. Now what about copying it over to, uh, to Excel? Well, for you know, those of you who work with uh, browsers, you know that this is pretty simple. You just highlight what you want, um, open up Excel, and paste it in. And you get something, you know, you have to do a little bit of tweaking to it, but you get something that's, you know, really out of the box, something you can now work with and do further analysis on. Nothing I've shown you so far really has anything to do with XBRL. It's simply the benefit of, you know, porting um, financial disclosure to HTML, which is, you know, everything is in HTML. Um, Emma, <laughs> MSRB's Emma system is in HTML. So we're just saying, instead of um, having the CAFRs be in PDF, you could just have them in HTML and get all of these, um, um, these benefits. But there's more because, um, you know, uh, financial statements are not necessarily that consistent in the way they uh, present things. So for example, um, you know, we have uh, uh, one of the samples I'll show you later, they show you <laughs> the prior year on the same statement as they show you the current year. So it gets a little bit complicated to know, you know, consistently, hey, you know, is this particular field going to have exactly um, what I want? But what XBRL brings to the table is the ability to tag these things. So here I'm using a JavaScript viewer that was uh, provided by XBRL International. And this allows me now to highlight um, various uh, elements um, on the page. So you can see how they've been tagged in, um, in inline XBRL. And so this, for example, is the assigned, um, is the assigned fund balance, as you can see um, here. So um, with, that, with that kind of thing embedded in the, exp in the uh, HTML file, um, a parser can automatically uh, extract and load this data so that it can be used for um, fiscal monitoring or, or academic research or, or what have you. So uh, just to give you an idea of you know, how nice you can make these um, statements look, um, I commissioned a uh, design firm to uh, tackle uh, the city of Los Angeles's um, CAFR. And again, these are just extracts of just a few, a few uh, schedules. But you can see that these are, this is a really, really nice looking um, document. Um, and uh, I've, here I've now embedded the, um, uh, the viewer <laughs> functionality right into the page. So I can just click on here and then you can see in this box down there, the, um, uh, the XBRL um, uh, identifying information that tells us, for example, that this is for the <laughs> fiscal year beginning 2007, July 1st and ending June 30th, 2018, um, that it refers to revenues and the, uh, the, embedded, uh, the embedded value. <laughs> By the way, uh, thanks very much uh, to Steve Owens. We have these census provided entity identifiers as well, 14, 14 position entity identifiers that could be used as a as a standard, there are 90,000 state and local governments in the US and the census has an identifier um, for each one of them. So um, that gives you an idea of uh, the, the presentation and now I just have to get in here so that, yes, okay. So now um, I'm gonna show you uh, a, um, uh, a financial statement that came from um, one of our vendor, one of our uh, members, uh, um, Easy XBRL, and this is uh, for the city of uh, Alexandria. Uh, sorry, Ash I think it's uh, excuse me, Ashland County, um, uh, Virginia. So um, this is being shown in a an inline XBRL viewer that was developed by the Securities and Exchange Commission. So the SEC adopted um, inline XBRL as the standard uh, for corporate reporting starting in 2020. Um, that decision was made um, last year, and uh, they've been tra transitioning to this over time. So there was a voluntary filing program, I believe, as early as 2016, if I'm uh, if I'm not mistaken. So we've had we've had samples of corporate inline XBRL for some time. The viewer was res released at that time and made completely open source. So we were just able to take a copy of this and implement it on the XBRL um, US uh, US's GitHub and on XBRL US's website. So the advantage of the viewer is everything that's um, XBRL tagged is in, in red. And you have this interface where you can, um, 
scroll through and see, for example, what the uh, you know what the definition is, okay, of the of the different items, um, and uh, some other supporting information here. Like this is um, this is indexed back to um, the uh, codification of government accounting standards uh, uh, published by the GASB, and you can see what, uh, for example, what paragraph and section of the uh, codification covered this particular um, item. So that gives you an idea of how this can be integrated with you know, existing open source technology that's provided by the um, SEC. Um, but vendors can use any kind of um, uh, viewing technology that they want. Workiva, for example, has released, recently released um, an open source IXPRL viewer. Here we're looking at one that was developed by um, Iris Business. Iris Business is the company that is uh, leading the development of the current, of the new version of the uh, of the taxonomy, which we're soft releasing today and we'll be fully releasing in, um, in May. It reflects both the um, inputs that we received from the version of the taxonomy that we published in January, um, as well as um, um, a, a much broader effort to include um, validation within the taxonomy. So the idea behind validation is, how do you know that the numbers on an XPRL filing are internally consistent? Um, how can you be sure that all the components of revenue add up to total revenue as reported on the calendar? <laughs> With XBRL validations, you're able to um, enforce that. So when the, um, the filer, say, uploads a file to, um, uh, to Edgar, uh, and we hope a future version of Emma, um, it would run a validation <laughs> process and reject the filing if all the numbers did, weren't internally um, consistent. And that's really... Uh, you know, uh, a, a sort of a design decision that has to be made in terms of just how much validation you do. Um, the uh, original SEC implementation had very little validation, and I think there were a lot of concerns about the quality of the data. On the other hand, you know, and we're working now with uh, large numbers of validations, and that can have uh, issues in terms of performance. So there's definitely some happy medium here where you, you want to make sure that things are accurate, and at the same time, you don't want to create too much inconvenience for the uh, filer. So anyway, with, res with respect to uh, what we're seeing here from Iris, this is um, uh, Columbus, Ohio's uh, 2017 CAFR. Um, and uh, as you can see, the, um, the, uh, the details of the tags come in down here. Um, one of the nice things about the, uh, um, the Iris uh, implementation <laughs> is you can highlight multiple uh, items at once and see um, multiple tags. Um, another another uh, organization that's participated in the uh, rollout of the uh, version 0.2 taxonomy is Data Tracks. Um, they contributed a CAFR for uh, the city of uh, or the county of McHenry, Illinois. This is the one with the prior year data mixed in that uh, <laughs> gave one of our programmers uh, a bit of a, a bit of a heartache. I want to show you, this is not in a viewer. This is just a plain HTML file. But let's just focus on um, how this looks in the HTML. So here we have inventories for governmental activities of 758,777. If we look at the, uh, at the HTML um, source, you can see, or maybe you can't see, uh, we have this structure here called IX non-fraction. So this is something that doesn't appear when you're viewing HTML because Chrome and Internet Explorer don't know about it, but they don't, they don't pick up or burp because this is here. And so this gives us the way of tagging that $758,877. So we know that it's in the US CAFR namespace and its current, uh, current inventories. We have some other things here, like for example, um, scaling. So if the numbers were presented in thousands, this would be a three. If it was in millions, this would be a six. And so that way um, you can intelligently decipher this number and bring it into a relational database. Okay, so what else do we have to show here? Um, all right, so this is a, a demo that we received from uh, Rose Enterprises um, last week. And it, I was really excited about this one because this really brings forward um, the use of XBRL um, <laughs> for state monitoring of um, local governments. And uh, that's something we're gonna hear about uh, later this afternoon. Um, but if we go through Alexandria, Virginia's CAFR, um, uh, our friends at uh, Rose Enterprises added a couple of schedules 
that reflect the kind of analysis that the Virginia Auditor of Public Accounts does. So uh, these are uh, 12 ratios that they look at. As, uh, as Ed told me, uh, it's sort of unfortunate in a way that we picked this one because this, uh, this government has no financial problems from the point of view of the state auditor. So it has a total of zero distress points. But good for Alexandria, and I guess some of you live there, so uh, kudos to that. But it would have been more fun to have a government that was in distress. <laughs> anyway, and I think uh, and I think if Sheila if Sheila Weinberg read around these numbers, we'd find it was a lot worse, right, than what they're reporting. <laughs> in any event, uh, uh, in terms of what is reported here, I just wanted to highlight how these ratios were calculated. So looking at the change of net position, you can see that. Um, Here's the 2017 um, value. And then here is the 2018 value. And again, it's uh, highlighted by the fact that this period is different. And then they simply, you know, in line created this, um, this ratio, which, uh, al which allowed them to, within the XBRL document itself, calculate the change in that position. So this is something that can really facilitate state monitoring of um, local government fiscal distress. Um, uh, uh, Yossi Newman and I wrote a paper on this issue and uh, has, as it applies to Virginia. Um, many of you from this area may know about, I think it's Petersburg, which had a fiscal crisis um, uh, several years ago, and that started the process in Virginia of doing this type of, uh, of monitoring. And so we hope that um, uh, the, the state will find uh, XBRL useful in, um, to, in using that. So just to wind up, um, we have uh, some open source tools available to help parse out the XBRL document. So again, you saw that there was that hidden tag in there. And you saw also that it's embedded in a lot of complicated looking um, HTML. But using this open source library that um, uh, a Reason Foundation donor actually <laughs> created for us, um, we're able to uh, run a program in, uh, written in Python that goes through one of these statements. This, in this case, we're looking at the um, uh, Columbus financial document and actually just pulls out the relevant information re re uh, related to those, um, to those tags. So um, it's uh, not being happy with me right now, but let's see if I can at least pull up what the uh, output looked like. Okay, well, I think, oh, I know the problem. I have it open, so yeah. So I ran it before and had it open. So. You can see here that it parsed out City of Columbus fiscal year end, and then some of the key um, financial statistics like the cash and cash equivalents for governmental activities and uh, liabilities and so forth. And uh, we also have a version of this um, that we're gonna release next week that will run strictly in Excel. So you might've seen there that I was running a, um, uh, I was running from a command prompt what this will do when you click this update button, it'll actually uh, analyze the, um, the CAFR at this particular URL, this one here, and then uh, pull out all of this um, financial information in a spreadsheet. And then you could eventually run this not just for one CAFR, but for dozens or hundreds of CAFRs and have it essentially uh, a spreadsheet or database of um, standardized um, CAFR data. So that's the type of thing that we're uh, working on. The um, version 0.2 release of the taxonomy will come out sometime in May. And uh, if you're on our mailing list, uh, you'll find out about it. So I, I guess I will now introduce the next speaker, unless there's any questions about this. Yes. Uh, just the tax we so the working group is only focusing right now um, on the, uh, uh, the the two government wide statements and the two uh, governmental fund statements. But um, uh, if we you know are able to eventually work with a state or a national organization that is able to you know fund the development of full taxonomy, there would be a couple of options there. Um, one is called block tagging where like a particular footnote would be just entirely tagged as a, as a text blob that you would then um, process. But you could then get also more granular within um, the, say the MDNAs. If there, are, if there are things that are really consistently reported, those items could become associated with elements and be, um, be tagged. Would you add anything to that or is that? No, yeah, okay.
So I understand the MSRB has been you know, theoretically supportive as if local governments adopted this format. Do you see any potential for the MSRB to be more directive about it and maybe go as far as requiring? Continuous? Well, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to speak for the MSRB. Um, our recommendation in um, in regulatory comments that we made to the SEC for their December municipal disclosure um, conference was that the MSRB adopt a voluntary disclosure program. So under that scenario, um, uh, a city would have the option of either uploading a PDF file or an inline XBRL file. And they would maybe get a little bit of a merit badge on EMMA for, uh, for doing that. And we actually think um, that's better than, you know, tomorrow morning pressing the mandate button and saying, okay, well, everyone's got to file this way. Um, it, it really is better to find um, a universe of early adopters to sort of shake out this technology. I mean, it's, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I was able to give you a demo that worked fairly well and you could see everything. But, you know, this, there's a lot of moving parts here and it's not, um, it's not all done. So it's really better to, you know, uh, phase this in gradually, find the governments like St. Petersburg, Florida, for example, that are really excited about this, work with them, get some really nice um, instance documents going and then roll it out to a larger universe of, of governments. And the other advantage of that is the cost of the technology will go down as it becomes more standardized <laughs> and, and more available for multiple vendors. Yes. Can I ask you a sure. Um, well, just to, to, to pick on the last point, MSRB regulates broker dealers and mutual advisors. The MSRB doesn't regulate insurers. So the derivative of the 10th Amendment held, but uh, <laughs> But also, um, quick case in point about IXBRL and its use in the corporate space. Are we at a nascent stage there? Are they at um, middle of the road? Are they using it well? Are they at the end of using IXBRL? Can you tell us like, how corporates are using IXBRL? With According to uh, an SEC report that I read recently, there are over 100 companies so far that have filed in uh, IXBRL. There are, I think, 6,000 companies that are affected by this. So it's uh, more like the second or third inning than the ninth inning. Um, but as uh, the various vendors in this working group and in XBRL US itself adopt compatibility with um, inline XBRL, um, it should be very easy to, uh, to, to roll that out. For example, I know that um, Workiva, Easy XBRL, um, Data tracks. Those are just some of the vendors that are already supporting inline XBRL. So it should be easy for any of their clients to convert. And just, well, just to just build on that, this coming quarter is when that kicks in as a mandate for the larger for the larger companies, right? So I said 2020, which was a bit of a uh, not a bit of an oversimplification. So it's phased in first for the bigger companies, and then by all companies by 2020, right? Yeah. And it's and that's the same way that the original XBRL program was placed. And inline XBRL is really sort of a variation on XBRL. It is XBRL, but with HTML kind of, you know, married together into a single document. So why was <laughs> XBRL vacated and IXBRL was... Because this gives you the opportunity to do a, a single filing. So with the current XBRL, they have to file an XML document and then they have to file a text document, right? They never really adopted HTML there because of they had a version of, of a text document which was sort of predated uh, HTML. So the SEC is making everyone until now file two documents. After this mandate comes in, they're going to be down to one document. So their life is going to be a lot easier. The other thing to know about inline is that the, the specification was created in 2011. And although it's relatively new in the US, it's been used around the world extensively. And there are millions of companies. Uh, primarily, a lot of private companies in the UK are reporting in using inline XBRL today. And so, in addition to the products that are available here in the US, there are lots of products outside of the US that prepare inline XBRL documents. Okay, so I'll uh, I'll introduce uh, Kimberly now. Do yes. we have do we have slides? Yes, she has slides. I will bring over slides. So, uh, thank you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, as Michelle told you, I, I have a rating agency um, background, and um, that's actually why I came to this. So I was um, I was working in the credit rating agency world uh, during the um, run up to the financial crisis, and um, 
you know, in thinking about all the bad things that happened uh, at rating agencies, which you can see from uh, watching uh, Michael Lewis movies, <laughs> um, you know, really that there needed to be sort of more competition for rating agencies and more democratization of how we uh, get and analyze financial data. And the place where we need that the most is uh, municipal. And then it's um, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the sets of research that I came across when I was um, entering the sector was um, some work by Dr. Kimberly Cornagia and her husband, Jeff, Jess Cornagia, um, on the um, problems that rating agencies have with rating um, bonds across different sectors. So it turns out that a, uh, and I'm not going to preview the whole talk, but it turns out that a AAA for a structured finance instrument is not the same thing as a AAA for a corporate instrument, and it's certainly not the same thing as a AAA for a municipal instrument. So we have a situation where um, the market is given these, you know, alphanumeric symbols and with really not a lot of explanation. And as a result, I think that uh, state and local governments um, could do a lot better by making their data more accessible and easier for non-rating agency participants to, um, uh, you know, to adopt. So without further uh, impinging upon her talk, I'll just tell you that Dr. Kanagia is a tenured professor at Penn State University. She studies credit risk and fixed income markets, publishing her research in top peer-reviewed finance journals. She serves as a credit risk expert with current and former clients, including the Swedish <laughs> law firms, the US SEC, and the Department of Justice. Thanks for coming here. Well, let's see if my PhD can work out. <laughs> press here, dummy. Okay. Top one? Oh, do we have to, we have to change the sharing up? Yeah. So while, while the technology is, is, uh, is being fixed, let me just follow up on what I was saying about emergence data or other commercially available data. Um, we, we've purchased it. Uh, it's not cheap from my perspective because, you know, I'm not a, a practitioner, but the, um, okay, still not smart enough. That's all right. I can just work it with, with I can work it with it. I can't I think, work with this. I think if you, um, oh, 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 click on the slide here. So, so what Mergent, uh, what we found in using Mergent's data is that they don't keep historical data. Anytime a, a, a field changes, they overwrite the prior field, which bonds are priced from a taxpayer perspective in the primary market, right? Well, lots of things change over time. If a credit rating changes, Mergent overwrites the previous credit rating with the new credit rating. So you haven't got a clue what the thing was rated when it issued. Which is a problem, and then when in, when uh, portfolios of insured bonds get novated for any number of reasons, the new insurance company just overwrites the old insurance company. So you don't even know who, who wrapped the thing when it was originally issued. So using Mergent or or any of other um, of Thompson and Reuters commercially available stuff is is really problematic if you care about how things got priced, um, you know, when when they were issued. So, um, okay, so how, how, how so, am I going to run these? All right, oh, that's backwards, oh, that's oh. forwards, brilliant. Uh, okay. <laughs> so so I've, I've worked on credit risk in, in fixed income markets for about 20 years. I'm an empiricist, uh, which means I, I start as an agnostic uh, observer, and I love the data to teach me how the world works. Um, the last maybe five or six years, I've been really focusing on municipal markets, which I do think are understudied. Um, a whole lot of empirical analysis has led me to believe that investors in this space are not just in, inattentive, but rationally inattentive, right? Information processing is not free, it's costly, and the benefit historically has been very low. Historically, the municipal market's been very low uh, default risk, um, and so the Again, I think very rationally, investors in this space have been intentionally inattentive, relying, I'm going to say exclusively on, on, on credit ratings. 
And again, I think that's rational because again, historically, I've got comprehensive data for about 30 years. Historically, the, the default rate is very, very low. The credit rating, although noisy, is a free public good. And then trying to actually mine the PDF for, for, for data to distinguish this bond from that bond is very costly. Moving forward, I think the PD in this space is not zero, right? We know the public pensions are a non-trivial and growing problem. Um, we're now start, you know, we're now starting to learn about all of the bank loans that were previously not disclosed. That's a problem, right? And so if the if the investors can't quickly and readily process the information themselves, they are likely to continue relying on credit ratings. And to the extent they don't trust the credit ratings for any number of reasons, then they just increase the risk aversion, increase the risk premium that they charge to the issuer. So moving forward, this is no longer, in my, in my opinion, likely to be a sleepy market where it's fine for investors to just be inattentive. So um, I'm quick overview of the empirical results. And I've got um, references for everything for anybody who wants to dig deeper. Uh, it's very clear empirically that investors in, in muni markets respond very slowly to value relevant information, relying almost exclusively on credit ratings, which we know are noisy and very sluggish indicators of, of risk. Um, historically, we've had AAA rated bond insurance, which was a nice substitute for disclosure, right? We can compare municipalities with relatively good disclosure to municipalities with relatively poor disclosure. And we know that those with poor disclosure relatively are more likely to insure their bonds. That's the substitute, right? You're not doing a very good job of giving us information. Just wrap the bond with a AAA rating and we're good. The problem is we don't have AAA rated insurance companies anymore wrapping these bonds. And so what I've got is compelling evidence that the investors don't value AA rated insurance the way they used to value AAA rated insurance. So we've lost the substitute for, for disclosure. Once we lose the substitute for disclosure, what we're left with is credit ratings. We know that credit ratings are an imperfect substitute for insurance because the credit rating agencies have no skin in the game the way the bond insurers once did. So we've lost the, the good substitute for disclosure, which was the AAA rated insurance. The credit ratings are, um, are, are filling that gap. But again, I think that's an imperfect uh, substitute. Uh, and there are, there's only one state to my knowledge that mandates disclosure of fees paid to specific rating agencies, and that's Texas. So digging into the Texas data, I can, I can show you that the credit ratings are highly correlated with fees, which if you remember the financial crisis, that makes us think terrible things. Um, but I actually think that's probably not the case here. The fees in the Muni space are trivial relative to the fees that Moody's and S&P were paid in, uh, in the structured space. So I actually don't think this is uh, to be best interpreted as a smoking gun of conflicts of interest. Rather, what I think this is, is the credit rating agencies trying to substitute for lost insurance. Used to be the case if you were wrapping the bond, the underlying rating didn't even get priced. So who cares? Now that we don't have AAA rated insurance, the underlying rating has become extremely important. And now we have to actually pay the credit rating analysts to do the work that the insurance companies used to, used to do. Um, again, because the fees paid to the credit rating agencies are so small in a relative sense, I think just my economic intuition tells me there's less likely going to be the ratings catering where we just sell AAA ratings to whoever can pay for them in this space. And I can tell you that historically, Moody's likes to uh, use uh, accuracy ratios as its, as its performance metric to gauge its own performance. Historically, the credit ratings um, produced by both Moody's and Standard & Poor's have been most accurate in public finance. That I think is in part due to the stricter scale. And in some sense, then the taxpayers are, are paying uh, or historically have been paying for that. If we have time, which we may not, I'll show you that um, there is significant, economically significant, not just statistically significant evidence of home bias in ratings. I'm from the great state of Nebraska. 
you're from some other state, you both rate municipalities, I give Nebraska higher ratings than you do, you give your homes with higher ratings than I do. That's very clear in the data. So even if we don't believe there are conflicts of interest at the credit rating agency level that we saw in the structured space, there does seem to be some analyst level uh, conflict. Uh, okay, so this is my, this is my, these are my pictures to show you investors that are, in, you know, very, very sleepy. Um, what I'm showing, this is, this is, this is MBA and AMBAC burning to the ground. And you can see that in, in uh, October of 2007, MBA and AMBAC lose about 70% of their market cap in, in a period of a couple of days. And I think Bill Ackman may have something to do with that. But it's very clear from public markets that these insurance companies are failing. This line is the first downgrade stripping them of their AAA credit rating. So it's clear from the publicly traded equity markets that MBA and back are burning to the ground. Moody's continues to rate them AAA until this is late June of 2008. That's not as new or interesting. Everybody knows the rating agencies are a little bit slow to downgrade. Um, <clears throat> what is new and interesting, I think, is that the, the secondary markets that were uh, pricing these wrapped bonds, that the, the portfolios that were insured by MB and AMBAC, don't start to price the underlying rating until after the downgrade of the insurance companies. As long as the insurance companies maintain AAA credit ratings, even though their stock had lost all of its value, they still got priced as if they were AAA municipal. Only after the credit, only after the uh, monolines lost the AAA rating, does the market start to price the underlying rating. So that's my first piece of evidence that the investors in the muni markets aren't even paying attention to publicly, you know, other linked public markets. Uh, my second piece of evidence comes from the recalibration, right? So historically, we know that Moody's had rated municipal bonds on a much stricter scale. And under some pressure uh, from lots of places, they decided to do, in, in May of 2010, they decided to, re, to do away with that stricter scale and migrate municipal bonds over to their global rating scale. Moody's, to their credit, definitely advertised that there's no information in these ratings changes. They're just recalibrating from Celsius to Fahrenheit. The number, the degrees are going to change tremendously, but the actual ambient temperature in the room hasn't changed at all. So there's no new information. And yet you can see that when they recalibrated from Celsius to Fahrenheit, these bonds repriced massively. For a three notch upgrade, it's 150 basis points change in the price of those wrapped stocks. So from this, we, this is the clearest indication to me that right or wrong, historically, investors were pricing credit ratings equivalently across asset classes, even though they meant very different things. So a municipal bond that was, say, um, AA3 gets upgraded to AAA, it's going to gain 150 point basis points return, meaning the price of the bond is going to increase to in to what to what its credit risk probably implied in the first place, right? So again, it's evidence of a strict adherence to the letter of the rating without bothering to maybe understand the differences in how those are applied across asset classes. Oops, wrong line. Um, okay, so this is my picture showing you evidence that once the insurance companies lost their AAA ratings, investors stopped valuing the, the insurance. <clears throat> I can, for anybody that's interested, I can show you selection models that will be more convincing than these pictures in terms of clean identification in my econometrics. But in terms of pictures, these are great. So this is comparing, so this is the period 1985 to 2007, MBA and MBAC, all of the monolines are AAA rated. And I'm just showing you the distributions of offering yields between insured and uninsured bonds. And what you can see is the insured yields, that's the blue line, the entire distribution is to the left of the uninsured yield. That fits with my intuition. 
you insure the bond, I charge you less true interest cost in terms of a lower offering yield, right? Now, what we see starting in 2008, after none of the monolines are rated AAA, they're all AA or lower, what you end up with is the insured bonds actually have higher offering yields than the uninsured bonds. So my first, because I'm an economist, my first, and I believe in you know, rational pricing, et cetera, I'm thinking, well, this has to be selection where crappy bonds buy insurance and good bonds don't buy insurance. The problem with that interpretation is twofold. Number one, that didn't prevail when we had AAA insurance. And number two, we have comprehensive, if not exhaustive data. And when I say comprehensive and if not exhaustive, we didn't just dump, merge it, and run. We went through all the no novation portfolios to appropriately uh, allocate each bond to its original uh, insurer at, at issuance. And using a Python programmer, <laughs> um, we were able to compile complete ratings histories for, for all of these bonds. So we, we know everything we can find from the census, from the MSRB, from Mergent, et cetera, et cetera, from the Novation portfolios directly from the insurance companies. We have data on the issuer. We, have, we know what the bond characteristics look like, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we have some pretty sharp selection models, which control for that, in, that selection you're concerned about, that endogenous choice to insure where some bonds don't need insurance and some do. And we still find that the offering yields are higher for the insured bonds. That's a puzzle because it's not clear why investors should punish you for paying for <coughs> lower quality insurance, but there's no evidence that, that there's a reduction in the true interest cost to the issuers that are paying for AA rated insurance. So again, with the loss of what used to be a fair substitute for disclosure, the disclosure I think becomes uh, even more important. And so when I'm saying there's a shift from wrapped bonds to either the need for disclosure or credit ratings, this is just looking at the fraction of new issues that are insured this is, you know, about 70% of new issues were wrapped when there was AAA insurance. When there's no longer AAA insurance, it dips to about 30% and recovers at a little over 40%. So most issuers just aren't paying for AA rated insurance. And again, those that are don't seem to be uh, benefiting too much. Do I have what, five minutes or two? Five minutes, skip. Okay, so here's the, uh, and again, sticking with pictures, there is a rigorous econometric analysis with very clean identification, I assure you. But what we're trying to do is, is pick adjacent counties issuing uh, general obligation bonds. And, and the, the reason we like adjacent counties is because we can say that things like uh, economic conditions and cultures are probably uh, comparable. So we're, you know, this is just an example. We're looking at Farmers Branch in Frisco, Texas. They share uh, a large border. Uh, they both issued $6.5 million of tax back bonds in roughly the same time period, a couple of months uh, difference. What we've made sure of is that the same lead analyst at Moody's and the same lead analyst at S&P are rating both bonds. Mm -hmm. And what we find is that Farmers Branch paid S&P got a better rating. Frisco paid Moody's, got a better rating. So if these numbers had more zeros, I would be concerned about ratings catering where I'm willing to sacrifice my reputation for cash. But because these numbers don't have very many zeros, my, my sense is this is not the ratings catering we saw in the structured space, but rather there's no longer that AAA rated insurance option. So now we actually have to pay at least one of the rating agencies for the time to actually do the fundamental uh, analysis. Uh, I'll skip that in the interest of time. This again is just the, these are, I, I mentioned Moody's likes accuracy ratios to, to, to report their own performance. Uh, an accurate, all an accuracy ratio is doing is basically um, measuring the area under the cumulative default distribution. And so you can see this line is the structured finance products. 
this line is what we would obtain if ratings were randomly assigned, right? If ratings were randomly assigned and there was no information at all, you would get a distribution that is this, this, uh, this hypotenuse here. So, so it looks like the structured products were pretty close to random ratings, <laughs> which is bad. Uh, but the top left, that's the, that's the municipal bonds. So historically, the accuracy, as Moody's likes to report it, for, for that space, for, for, for the muni bonds has actually been quite high. But again, the grain of salt here is this is 30 years with no defaults. What happens when the pension funds actually become a problem and the previously unreported bank loans become a problem, it's really hard, uh, I think, to, to, to forecast based on the historical Last thing, and then I'll conclude. This is just one anecdote. Again, I assure you there are rigorous uh, and very clean identification strategies in the, in the, in the paper. Uh, but what we did is we, look, we, we have social security numbers for all of you. I'm sorry about that. That's just the way it is. Um, but using the first three digits of a social security number, I can tell where the social security number was obtained. Generally, that happens around age 13, 14, whenever somebody gets their first job. I also, using LinkedIn, can see where all of these analysts are educated. So the lead analyst at S&P that's rating uh, the city of La Crosse has a social security number that starts with 390, which tells me he grew up in the state of Wisconsin. He's got a bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. Uh, and he gives La Crosse a AA credit rating. Moody's lead analyst has a social security number that was issued in the district. Uh, she, as far as I can tell, has never been to Wisconsin, but she certainly didn't get any degrees there. And she gives a credit rating that's two notches lower. And so once we control for the credit rating agency fixed effects, which controls for differences in methodologies, and we control for bond issue fixed effects, which controls for all the fundamentals of the issue, whether it was insured or not, et cetera, et cetera. And we control for the month of issuance, which controls for all the macroeconomic conditions, we still find that where the, home, where the analyst is from, from that home state or not from that home state, matters to the tune of two to three notches difference in, in credit ratings uh, for, for municipalities. So again, I, I really truly don't believe this is a huge problem at the agency level. This is a non-trivial, I don't know if it's a problem or not. This is a non-trivial effect at the analyst level. Uh, so just to conclude, there's in, to, my, to this person's uh, uh, trained eye, it's pretty clear investors are relying heavily, if not exclusively on credit ratings for information. Um, the muni analyst is in fact, observationally subject to a home bias. Um, <clears throat> rating fees are correlated with ratings, but again, I think this is most likely the increased due diligence that at least one of the analysts has to do given that there's no longer AAA insurance. Um, the great state of Texas is the only state that's even allowing us to look at that analysis. I would love to see the SEC actually require disclosure of what every issuer on the planet is paying Moody's and S&P the same way auditors have to disclose what they're getting paid. If you see a, a fee that's twice what you expect, it's, it's, you know, it gives you pause in terms of the quality of the rating or the audit. And then finally, I do think standardized reporting in, in machine readable format is, it's got to improve the informational efficiency. We don't have the AAA insurance. The credit ratings are, you know, slow and imperfect in other ways. I think having a handful of well-capitalized investors that could just run their own models would make this market a lot more efficient, which would translate into lower issuance costs for the taxpayers. References. Thank you. <laughs> sure, sure. We have time for a few questions. Sure. Sure. So what did they end up, what was the end, what was the true reduced cost both of these ended up paying for having paid up more for? That's a good question that I can't answer without going back to the data. 
Yeah, for in this paper, we were mostly interested in whether this relationship between fees and data, uh, sorry, fees and ratings held up controlling for every other thing. Uh, we haven't mapped this into mergent. As, we, as was discussed before, taking the, 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 um, taking the offer yields from mergent and mapping those into, into the characteristics. I, I have a PhD student that spent a little over two months at the Bloomberg terminal working on this, it can be done. Um, but if the census wants to save us all time and, and <laughs> map those Q-SIPs to, the, to, I, to their borrowing. So We've asked them, and we do have a Python programmer that's working on going through and systematically um, pulling. Essentially, this. though, they are yep. publicly releasing them by yep. having them up running. So correct, so correct. So but but in a very but again, without a Python program, we we did just a back of the envelope how long it would take to hire an <laughs> army of research assistants to gather that data, and it came up we came up with about twelve thousand hours. Uh, so it definitely needs to be done programmatically. So just one point on that. Um, so I worked for S P for 25 years as an analyst. Um, so I'm not sure why you know that correlation would occur. I'm not disputing it. Um, but the analysts have no idea. Yeah, the, 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 this the I know. Analysts, yep. The entire rating yep. committee, none of their managers yep. know before, during, yep. after. If you ever saw a fee, even by mistake, you know somebody send you a sources and uses, and the fee happened to be in there. You had to inform your yeah. clients. They had to decide if you were compromised. Yeah, I've, I've worked for the Securities and Exchange Commission multiple times on these type of issues. I know this is true. I have a debate with some of my colleagues there about whether that's right and good. Um, but but yeah, and, and again, I, I really am not suggesting that this is a pay to play. In fact, the title of our paper is that this is pay for work, not pay to play. I, I think even if the analyst doesn't know what he or she is getting paid, they do know how many hours they're working, and and I, whoever is negotiating the fee has to be taking that workload into account. Yeah. So the, the FAR mm -hmm. amount, the sector, and the complexity are the three factors. What well, what I what I should then say is we do have the fee schedules, even though S and P doesn't want us to have the fee schedules. Some of the issuers have given them to us. So what we can do is we can take the fee schedule where S and P says here's what your fee is going to cost, given the size of the issue, the complexity, et etc. Cetera, et cetera. We're looking at abnormal fees. So what they charge that is not indicated by the fee schedule, and we're finding abnormal fees are positively correlated with rating, which again, it's, I'm not saying it's pay to play. I am saying the fee schedules aren't very good predictors of what the ultimate fee paid looks like. Um, and I, but again, because these numbers are so small, my economic intuition is that S and P is not going to sell reputation for twelve thousand dollars. It's not. It's it's five thousand dollars. You know, Delta. I think they did sell out their reputation to make much more money in the structured space, and and, and the D Justice Department agrees with me on that conclusion. I don't think that's what's happening here. I do think this is work where the analyst is now doing what the insurance company used to do. Yes, I, I would just want to add that. Uh... The, the, the AAA ratings of MBIA, AMVAC, and several of the other um, useful bond insurers mm -hmm. are also an indication of rating failure because yeah. this several year. of those firms either uh, went bankrupt or um, had to cancel some of their yeah. insurance coverage in yes. the event of default. Both of these. And yet, yes. And and um, I think there were actually seven that were rated AAA before, before 2008. If you I just. That paper that I, that I wrote. So this, and, and then. When they were downgraded, the entire auction rate market yes. seized up. Yes. So <laughs> I think it's a huge case of rating agency malpractice that's really been very yeah. underpublicized yeah. because of every all the focus on a very simple customer. Merton structural model tells me the following. So if I look at so in, in December of 2007, if I run a Merton structural model that helps me estimate distance to default, MBAA's distance to default is approximately 1.1. That maps to a about a nine percent default probability. If I go to Moody's corporate bond table, which MBA and AMBAC were were uh, 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 the, the 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 default probability of nine percent.
based on Moody's 2007, ta 2007 PD table, suggests triple C2. That's the map. If you've got a 9% default probability, the rating that implies is triple C2. That's 17 notches lower than the AAA rating that they affirmed in the face of, of this um, equity, equity market erosion. So, and again, eventually they downgrade to, the first downgrade is to A1. A year later, they downgrade to double B3. And less than a year later, the firm was bankrupt. So I, I agree, Mark. Thanks. Just, okay, Sheila, yeah, as far as the XPRL with the CAFR data, what, what our research has found is that if you look at an adjusted unrestricted net assets, the government's um, unfunded debt, um, with the new, with if you adjust those for the uh, pension, new pension standard and OPEP, they're a better predictor of the government's financial than the bond ratings, and they they lead the bond ratings. Um, I I believe it, but I haven't. Seen, is do you have a working so paper? University is researching okay. that for us. Okay, um, maybe I could get in touch. I'd love to see that and yeah. cite it. And then just uh, just. To, pet peeve of mine is that the bond ratings are only looking at the risk for the bond holders, not the risk of a government for the taxpayers. <laughs> okay. Kimberly, thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. pleasure. Um, I, I also want to mention that one of our speakers uh, is probably not going to make it today. Um, Marcus Stanley. Uh, He's here. Oh. oh, he is here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So we need to move along quickly. All right. Okay, so our next speaker is um, is Matthew Reed, who is Chief Counsel at the Office of Financial Research with U.S. Treasury. And um, uh, Matt doesn't have any slides, but I'm just going to give a, a quick introduction. Um, Matt is, in addition to being Chief Counsel, he is Chairman of the Regulatory Oversight Committee of the Global Legal Entity Identifier System, uh, the GLEAF which is a committee of more than 50 authorities from around the globe overseeing a new system of financial entity identification. Uh, before, uh, before joining the, the OFR, he was a senior lawyer at the SEC, um, where he worked specifically on the uh, SEC's interactive data filing program, and was deputy for the chairman's initiative to use technology to transform financial disclosures and reporting. So Matt, thank you. Thank you. So um, no slides. Uh, uh, if we can, I'll get access to the lab and, and show some of the that. later. But um, just real quick. Uh, so first of all, I'm not the current chairman. I was the first chairman of the thing. I'm going to talk about it in a minute. Um, but a brief bit of background. I was at the SEC. I'm a lawyer by training. Um, what I have found in my government career, uh, which has spanned two decades now, uh, is that um, technology is often something that gets added on at the end of the policy. Uh, and that creates a huge problem because then you try to sort of retrofit uh, technology to, uh, to adhere to, to the policy. Um, I first became introduced to XBRL when I was working up at the uh, chairman's level. I was working for a commissioner at the SEC when Chairman Cox pushed through the XBRL program. Um, we, uh, then, then I got, uh, went down and worked in the staff on the implementation piece of it. Uh, and then I came over uh, to Treasury, where I was uh, central to an effort to create a global identifier for um, any entity globally that participates in a uh, financial transaction. So Census uh, has an identifier for all these entities. They would be eligible for an LEI, but for reasons that will make sense in a moment, um, you know, yours is a more expedient approach than, than ours. Uh, so what, uh, what I think I'm here to do is talk a little bit about, uh, from, a, uh, from a government perspective, how you solve these, what are essentially collective action problems, um, uh, by looking at what we did in the case of, of the LEI as a case study. So um, a, a brief history of the LEI, the Legal Entity Identifier. Um, during crisis, uh, myself, I was at the SEC at the time, and people from the Fed and the, uh, uh, and the uh, uh, FDIC and the OCC, all the alphabet soup of uh, regulators, were trying to figure out who had what information about these companies that were teetering on the brink of failure and whether we could share it. Uh, and then, uh, and the answer to that is yes, because in a crisis, you'll do whatever you need to do. Uh, and, um, and when we share it, what can we do with it? And, and so, you know, we went through the messy process of uh, figuring out, you know, to the extent we could, what might happen 
uh, between the Friday and the Monday that Lehman uh, uh, was going through the failure process uh, and, um, and, and on and on and on. Uh, and after the fact, recognized that the one common basic building block that we lacked was knowing who was who in our financial markets. Without knowing who was who, you couldn't possibly understand who owned whom. So if this entity of Lehman was ultimately connected to this entity of Lehman, a guarantee from this entity of Lehman, and this one was connected to Goldman Sachs, who was in the whatever. So you needed to know who owned whom, and then finally you needed to own, know who owned what. And that really mattered uh, uh, not uh, for, for financial stability purposes, not as much for um, uh, resolving a particular firm because uh, uh, bank regulators and others figure that out, but for understanding long-term relationships. And by long-term, I could mean an overnight repo transaction between two parties, which would cause money to flow, uh, shock to propagate. Um, so what... What we found ourselves doing was trying to figure out, could we in the United States solve this problem? Uh, we looked around for what available resources we could use. There was the QCIP. Uh, QCIP, the problem with it is, of course, it doesn't identify entities, it identifies instruments, um, which are often one for one correlated, but sometimes 100, 200, or 1,000 to one. Um, there's also this proprietary problem with the QCIP, which answers the question that you're gonna get your lawyers to answer, which is no. Um, and, and the reason you can do a single search, you can download it for your own purposes for research, but they're not going to let you open a commodity uh, because their business models work. So we couldn't use a proprietary identifier. Then we thought about, well, what about in the U.S.? Can we just sort of say, this is what you're going to use. All of us financial regulators need to get together and use it. And, uh, and, and if you want to participate in U.S. markets, then you got to use this identifier. The problem with that is the financial crisis was a global one. And so will that and Marcus, I'm sure we'll talk about this. Like this is not a, uh, America is, is, is not operating in a vacuum. So when we need to understand how these major complex global institutions are going to affect one another and the U.S. Uh, Fed or Treasury is speaking to the European Central Bank, is speaking to the Japanese securities regulator, the JFSA, we need to be able to say, indeed, the entity that I'm looking at in Japan and the sub-entity in particular is the precise one that you're looking at in Europe and you're looking at in the U.S. So that means if you go U.S., you're going to either have a small pot that you're going to have to then map to how many countries are there, um, or you're going to have to try to persuade these folks from other countries to just uh, follow the U.S. path. That's not going to work. So what we decided to do as a U.S. government is first build some bridges to some people in Europe who saw the problem the same way, in particular the European Central Bank, and second, go to the G20. G20 got behind this, which is a remarkable thing. So to have these massive uh, 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 financial uh, uh, authorities around the world, the finance, uh, uh, the treasuries and the finance ministers and the central banks get behind a data standard and actually put in G20 communique, uh, communiques that uh, a, a code should be created to identify financial market participants was, a, was an amazing thing. So we got this up to the G20, which then tasked something called the Financial Stability Board, which is like this group of, of government uh, authorities around the world to come up with a, a plan. So what we did uh, from that point on is we had, uh, at the time there were uh, 45 authorities uh, from 30 or so countries around the world, but really the ones that were gonna drive the bus. So the major regulators in the United States and in Europe, uh, in Asia, we got China to the table, we got Russia to the table. Um, but more importantly, Hong Kong and Japan. And um, we all created uh, a consensus approach to building essentially a done number. We looked to ISO. ISO came up with a 20 character alphanumeric code uh, that um, ironically, you actually have to pay to get the code, uh, but everything else became free. We knew we needed to have a funding <coughs> mechanism that avoided the proprietary uh, problem, right? So. So we, we said, well, look, the various models here are get governments to pay for this, um, <coughs> especially at the time in 2009, 2010, 2011, you weren't going to have governments uh, take on more long-term financial obligations. Then we looked at uh, the possibility of having, you know, those most interested from the private sector pay. So this was essentially the city banks, the big banks. The concern with that was that there could be some control that uh, later down the road, we didn't really want to, to have to deal with. And they might uh, favor their uh, 
their counterparties and getting in line to get an LEI, which could essentially block a trade. In fact, right now in Europe, you have something called no LEI, no trade. So if you don't actually have one of these codes, you can't participate in a financial market, uh, a, a bond or a stock issuance. Um, so what we decided we would do is create an issuer paid uh, LEI. So if you want uh, an LEI or you have to get one because you have to comply with some regulation, uh, you go out and you pay about 50 or $75. Um, so that was problem one that we sought to solve. Uh, problem two, so that, that's the funding mechanism. There's still some wrinkles with that that we're dealing with. Um, problem two was governance. So we knew that we needed this thing to be, one, uh, suitable for government use for long-term purposes. So again, the problem that we were trying to solve and continue to try to solve is knowing who is who in our financial markets and who owns whom. The system does that right now to some degree uh, uh, with the who owns whom that's it's still in a nascent state. And then eventually who owns what? And I'll explain how that happens in, in a second. Um, so uh, we wanted to have uh, this group that had loosely formed as uh, the creators of the, of the LEI system to come together under a, a, a non-treaty-based uh, organization. We call it the LEI Regulatory Oversight Committee, and I was the first chairman of that. Um, that group operates by consensus. All the government uh, authorities, like the Treasury, like the Fed, and so on, assent to the charter, uh, and they kind of agree to play well with each other in the sandbox. Uh, we, we have uh, we uh, worked through consensus the whole way through. We built it in kind of a, a big way uh, so that down the road, when other uh, needs to create standards uh, arise on a global basis, we can potentially govern those standards as well. And that's happening right now with um, transaction and product identifiers for derivatives. The next thing we wanted to make sure we could do is, uh, as soon as we came together on what this thing ought to look like, get the government out of the way. Because if there's anything that I learned during my days at the SEC working on XBRL, it's the government can say who can develop the standard, but if you rely on governments, especially multiple governments, to maintain a standard, they're not going to do it fast. Um, so we created a foundation in Switzerland, which is a, a, a private foundation. Uh, we appointed a board of directors, and that foundation acts kind of like the ICANN of the internet. It's the nucleus of the LEI system. From there, it formed a bunch of relationships with utilities around the world that you can go get your LEI. So these utilities in the U.S. are Bloomberg and DTCC, which is Depository Trust Clearing Corporation. They created a little, uh, I think, a, an Amsterdam company. But you can go in the U.S. and get your, your code there. You can go anywhere in the world and find a, a, a utility to go and get your code. Um, but we wanted to have the private sector involved in, in creating the standard itself. So that's why we use ISO and implementation of the standards. So that's why we use this private second mechanism. But you think it's gonna be more nimble and have the ability to iterate a little bit. So they've already taken on identification of corporate forms. Are you an LLC? Are you a corporation? Are you a sole proprietor and so forth? They do that for ISO as an administrator of that particular standard. The system now has about 1.3 million um, uh, entities around the globe that have received their LEI. We had to figure out a way to um, create an, an enforcement or adoption mechanism. Because I think as the people in this room would certainly understand a standard is useless if it's not used, right? So we needed to find a way to, um, to either encourage or force the adoption of the LEI by uh, financial market participants. We've had middling success on that, to be quite frank. Uh, our goal has been to require the use of the LEI where governments felt like it was necessary. And we would expect to reach a critical mass so that the private sector would ultimately adopt it. We're just, I think, teetering on the edge of that. Um, there are about 50 regulations throughout the world uh, that in some way or another either require or allow the use of the LEI in reporting or require that you obtain an LEI to transact. So I talked about Europe's no LEI, no trade rule. The Treasury, through my office, we just issued a rule where we'll collect information on repo market transactions. Those are our repurchase agreements, which uh, banks and others use for overnight funding. Um, that will drive a reference rate uh, that if people are familiar with LIBOR and the problems with LIBOR. Um, we wanted a market-based alternative to LIBOR. Uh, we created something called the SOFR, the Secured Overnight Funding Rate. The repo transactions are what populate uh, that rate. OFR is now collecting, uh, starting the fall, we'll be collecting all the repo transactions uh, uh, 
that are clear here in the U.S. and will require an LEI for all the various parties in those transactions. So, so the mechanism for ensuring adoption has been in part through uh, mandating it through regulation. That has also created stickiness on the part of the authorities, getting us to sort of stay with the LEI over the course of years, over the course of political changes. Um, the, the last piece of it uh, we expect will be um, that these banks and others will adopt it. We, we are hoping that we have kind of the barcode effect. So the barcode was created by GS1. It was used with some success by certain companies. My understanding is that once Walmart got involved and said, you know what, if you wanna be a supplier to Walmart, you're gonna, you're gonna need to get a barcode that created just this rapid adoption. We think we're already seeing this with two or three of the major banks. Once they start, once we drive the cost of the LEI down a little further, it started at about $200 a code. It's now around 50. We think it'll drop further. Eventually, banks will say, look, if you want to be a counterparty to us, you're going to have to get an LEI. And then that will create sort of this explosion of LEIs um, throughout the world. I leave you, I guess, with just sort of the top line lessons. I wrote a little paper a few years ago with my two co-chairs, one from Europe and one from Asia, about what we learned in this process. Number one, and I don't know the extent to which this is going to apply to the, your solution, although you know, we were dealing with authorities all over the world, you're dealing with authorities all over the country. Um, number one, uh, top level, kind of from our perspective, C-suite or appointee level support is critical, not just in the inception, but throughout. To have that, you have to have dedicated people within these agencies who actually believe in this thing and are willing to champion it throughout. The second thing is you need an elevator speech. So for the LEI, it became who is who, who owns whom, and who owns what. And, and you can put all kinds of meat about that around that. We, um, we were struggling a little bit a few years ago getting our message through. So that foundation created, um, hired McKinsey to put together a study that estimates that, it, uh, that the LEI can save the financial services industry $560 million a year just to perform some sim simple reconciliation tasks between their client uh, database and their um, and their trade database. Um, and then the last thing that I think our takeaway was is you, you do need to think about the enforcement mechanism. So Mark was talking about the voluntary approach. Um, we did that at the SEC with XBRL. Uh, Chairman Donaldson used a pilot at first. Um, we got enough data through the pilot uh, to get satisfied that there was a business case for that. Um, then when we implemented the rules, you might remember we did a uh, two or three year uh, liability waiver, essentially. We said, you know, you're eventually going to be liable under the securities laws for failure to provide accurate information in that separate file, but we're going to give you a little break for a couple of years while you get used to it. Um, but um, but it's, I think, I think key to have some sort of a, a mechanism to ensure that the data are going to be continually reliable unless you can be satisfied that market pressure is going to perform that service. And I don't know whether that would be the case. So those are hopefully uh, some helpful remarks after that. Okay. Any questions? Can we, can we have questions for that? Can I take a question? The development of the XTRL infrastructure in the corporate space, when it was initially discussed, why wasn't the municipal market included in that conversation? I don't know. I do know that the SEC, so so this was under Chairman Donaldson. Yeah. Um, and, and then um, I think it was Cox who created that consortium with the um, yeah, with the with, with, with the you know big uh, accounting firms at, at the time. And they were, you know, I imagine some of it was simply the business case, right? So so you had um, the SEC with primacy over uh, corporate filers. Um, already you had a 16,000 uh, taxonomy, which was pretty pretty enormous, uh, and so it may just been a matter of uh, bandwidth. Um, could it also have been the tower amendment? I mean, you know, uh, so so Mike Post used to work for the SEC and is now the general counsel. I mean, I know they they struggle with. It, it just just to add to that. I I know at the time that the MSRB, I think it was about the same time that the MSRB was actually adopting EMA. And so that was kind of a big initiative for them to, for the first time, begin accepting electronic documents, PDFs, of you know, financial statements from municipalities. So, so that was a that was a big step forward. And it's kind of if you look at, at the SEC reporting, you know, back in 1983 was when Edgar was pushed in place. So if you kind of look at them as, as analogous, you know, you have Edgar over here, or Emma over here. So putting Emma in place was a big step. And and I think um, I think he came a little bit late because of 
uh, but but they actually put out a letter, an announcement about Emma, and in it they said, you know, XML is an interesting idea, and at some point it may be worthwhile looking into XML. This was actually from a letter from I think, uh, March of 2009. So I think it was considered, but it probably just wasn't wasn't his time at that point. But we think it, it may be now. Yeah, I would just add that I don't think Edgar collects files from these collections. So, that's right. That's so right. I expect they were focused on their own collections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and also, just, just to clarify, I mean, what we're talking about with this initiative you know, that, that Mark is, is heading up is we're exploring what's going on. It, it's kind of like we're in the voluntary filing stage, or, or we hope to be in the voluntary filing stage. We're look, looking at what are the pros and cons of, of moving in this direction. We think there are big positives, obviously. We think this makes a lot of sense, but honestly, there's, there are kinks that need to be worked out. Any other questions from Matt? Okay, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, our next speaker, um, I'm sorry, Mark is not you. <laughs> I, think, I think we should go to Adrian Liu. Um, Adrian, um, Adrian Liu is with the Pew Charitable Trust. And um, Adrian is a manager on the state and local fiscal health portfolio. She conducts research on the fiscal health of state and local governments and currently leads projects assessing how states detect and respond to fiscal distress in local governments and how states manage their debt. So I'm gonna pull up your slides for you here. And I'm sorry, we are running a little bit late. I hope that everybody can stick around um, because we will have uh, uh, Marcus from Americans for Fiscal uh, Policy is gonna be speaking to the end here. Also, just as an added inducement, uh, uh, Irish business just uh, contributed uh, 10 additional advantages. So uh, <laughs> even if you're not a member of the working group, we should be able to uh, give you one check of it. So. Um, good afternoon, my name is Adrienne Liu and I'm a researcher on the state and local fiscal health team at the Pew Charitable Trust. For those of you who aren't familiar with Pew, we are a nonpartisan nonprofit research and advocacy organization um, working to conduct research and improve public policy in a broad range of areas. Um, the state and local fiscal health team works, um, conducts research and works with states to improve public policy in areas um, such as debt management, um, tax incentives and rainy day funds. So I'm here today to talk about how states use local government fiscal data to track and assess the fiscal health of local governments. In 2013, Pew conducted a 50 state survey looking at how and when states intervene in local government fiscal crises. Um, and we define intervention as when states take over decision-making authority from local officials. Um, in this re research, we examined which states allow their, uh, uh, allow, uh, have laws defining local fiscal distress which states allow their local governments to file for bankruptcy, um, and whether and how the states actually intervene in their local governments. Among the recommendations that came out of that report was for states to take a more proactive approach to figuring out when local governments might be in fiscal crisis or heading in, in that direction. Um, and the, the idea was that by detecting fiscal distress earlier, um, states could help local governments to address problems sooner and perhaps avoid um, more severe fiscal distress. Following that report, we took a step back to look at what states do before local governments reach um, the fiscal crisis stage. In our next report, which was published in 2016, we examined which states monitor local governments for fiscal distress um, and how they do that, meaning how often they check in with localities, what sources of data they use, what indicators they look at, um, whether monitoring activities are required by state law and what happens when they actually find um, fiscal distress. So today I'll talk about some of those findings and I'll um, offer a few updates as well. So before we dive in, I wanna define our terms a little bit for you. Um, you may be wondering what is fiscal monitoring? There's no standard definition for it, but we look for states that actively and regularly review fiscal information from their local governments to either specifically look for fiscal distress or more generally just to monitor their fiscal condition. 
Um, and the two parts of that definition um, to break down are actively and regularly. By actively, we were looking for states that were proactively collecting and assessing this information. We did find some states that will take action if they learn about fiscal distress um, through whatever means, including you know, local government asking for help. Um, but if they were not proactively seeking out that information, we didn't include them. Um, and the other part of our definition is regularly. And we were looking for states that were doing this on some sort of a regular schedule. Um, some states do this as often as quarterly, more typically it's annually, some states as rarely as once every two or three years. Um, and we were looking at states that were analyzing their general purpose local governments, meaning counties, cities, towns, and villages. We excluded um, school districts, which typically have a very different kind of relationship with states, as well as special purpose districts. <clears throat> So based on our definition, we classified 22 states as having uh, fiscal monitoring systems. We cast a pretty broad net because we wanted to meet states where they are. Um, so these include states that don't, in, don't um, require fiscal monitoring by state statute. Um, in some states, as I mentioned, it happens pretty infrequently. Um, and in some states, it may only apply to counties or the largest cities. Um, in addition, we classified eight of the 22 states as having early warning systems. Um, and by that, we mean uh, the state had uh, a law defining local fiscal distress, as well as a system in place intended to try to identify um, when a local government might be headed in that direction. Um, we found that states take a wide variety of approaches to fiscal monitoring, including who actually does the work. Um, and on the slide, you'll see some examples of departments and agencies that conduct this kind of work in different states, including <coughs> auditors, controllers, economic development, legislative auditors, um, and treasurers. Um, so when we talked to state officials in, in all of the states, they told us that they're already collecting data from their local governments. Um, but many acknowledge that they're not making particularly good use of this data. And in fact, one of them said, um, when we asked them, what do you do with all this data that you're collecting every year? They said, we put it in a filing cabinet. <laughs> um, so among the states that conduct fiscal monitoring, the most common sources of data were audits, um, budgets, um, both proposed and adopted, and um, financial reports. Um, and there are also a few less common examples of sources of data on the slide. Um, we found that there's broad variation in the number and the uh, kinds of indicators used to analyze fiscal health. Um, for example, Michigan by state statute relies on a single indicator, the presence of a deficit, while Nevada examines 27 different indicators, all of which are detailed in state statute. Um, we classified indicators into three broad categories, um, financial, <coughs> environmental, and management. On the slide, you'll see some broad categories of financial indicators that are often used. Um, and specific metrics and benchmarks vary, but Pew found that um, one, common, one very common measure um, indicator used was um, local government operating position. So in addition to financial and indicators, we found that some states look at environmental indicators, um, and these can include things like community needs and resources. Um, some examples are population declines, property values, and employment rates. Um, Short-term shock indicators can be things like um, in the state of Washington, uh, they ask whether litigation costs or legal judgments might be out there that might risk depleting an available reserve fund. The state of Nevada asks whether uh, a, a single employer might account for a disproportionate amount of, the, of employment in an area. Um, and finally, um, intergovernmental constraint, Pennsylvania and New York both ask um, whether local government has reached their legal taxing limit. And the final category, management practice indicators, can include things like mispayments, management issues, and credit ratings. The next two slides are just some examples of indicators um, that were found in, a, in different states. I'll give you a second to put those. Um, and then I mentioned I would offer a few state updates. We haven't done a comprehensive 50-state uh, update yet, but um, as Mark mentioned earlier, the state of Virginia in 2017 adopted 
by a, a budget provision um, to adopted a budget provision calling on the auditor of public accounts to create an early warning system. And this is to let local governments know that they might be in fiscal distress or in the or approaching fiscal distress. Um, and this happened after the city of P Petersburg um, experienced a severe fiscal crisis. Um, in Colorado, uh, which has been doing fiscal monitoring for some time in 2017, the Department of Local Affairs launched a pilot program known as the Fiscal Stability Strategic Planning Initiative. Um, and that's in, intended to identify local governments that may be at um, particular risk for fiscal distress and it um, is intended to help them adopt um, financial and management best practices. Um, Ohio likewise has been conducting fiscal monitoring work for decades, um, but in 2017, their Auditor of State's Office produced a new report for the first time um, analyzing 88 counties and 247 cities based on either 15 or 17 indicators, depending on the kind of accounting system used. Um, and that was also intended to flag fiscal distress. And finally, the state of Massachusetts um, is currently monitoring at both an early warning and an early intervention program. Um, the Division of Local Services within the Department of Revenue historically has waited until a local government um, was at the point of needing a bailout from the state before they took action. Right now, they're trying to be a little bit more proactive um, and try to figure out when fiscal distress might be um, about to happen or on the horizon and trying to work with local governments before they reach that stage. Um, so just a few notes about data collection challenges that we've heard from in talking to state officials. Um, of course, data quality and standardization are, are big issues. Um, some states have told us that they address this by using either third party data sets or checks by an auditor to try to verify the information they receive from their local governments. Um, automation is seen as something that can help to um, improve data quality, but of course, establishing it um, requires resources that states sometimes feel they don't have. Um, differences among local governments can pose a challenge. Um, depending on the state, um, local governments can have, for example, different fiscal years, um, which, can, which can make um, data standardization a challenge. Um, having a uniform chart of accounts is tremendously helpful. Um, the state of New York, for example, had one in, before they set up their monitoring system. And without that, um, it'd be very difficult to try to address some of these data standardization issues. Um, and similarly, cash versus gap counting, um, when local governments are using different accounting systems, that can also create issues. Um, the second issue, resources or lack thereof. Nobody likes an unfunded mandate. And so, you know, many states have talked to us about there being a lack of resources to try to implement any, any of this kind of work. And so that's um, a significant issue. Um, and then lags in data um, for states that are you know, only collecting data once a year, and particularly if they're relying on audited financial statements or audits, um, by the time they're assessing the data, it may be a year or two old, which is um, a challenge when you're trying to look ahead uh, for things that may be coming back. Um, so other considerations, states told us that having more indicators is not necessarily better. Um, there is value to simplicity. Um, again, using New York State as an example, in their most recent version of their monitoring, monitoring system, they actually reduced the number of indicators that they looked at because they found that having, you know, having more numbers wasn't necessarily giving them a, any fuller picture of what was happening. Um, and then today I've been talking about fiscal monitoring, um, but of course states collect local government data and they may present local government data for other reasons and other purposes. So that's something else to keep in mind. Um, and relatedly, um, who the data is intended for can have an impact on how the state may want to um, present the data. Um, so depending on whether the state is using itself for monitoring as we've been talking about, whether the state is intending for local governments to use the data themselves to better understand their fiscal position, um, or if it's intended for the public or researchers or journalists, all of which may have different needs as well. Um, so three final takeaways for today. Um, the first is that state governments are already collecting lots of fiscal data from local governments, um, but many are not making good use of it. Um, second is that the data should be seen as a starting point for conversations and not an ending point. 
Um, describing local government problems can be hard, but getting the data can help ensure that everybody is talking about at least the same problem. On the other hand, the data don't tell a complete story. And so um, it's important to, to dig deeper, I think, than just the numbers. Um, and finally, states can use the data they're collecting both for fiscal monitoring, as we've been talking about, but also just to increase transparency and accountability to the public. <laughs> Thanks very much. Happy to answer any questions. Sort of interested when you mentioned that at least one state is collecting data more frequently than annual. Um, when uh, uh, Chair, uh, SEC Chairman Clayton spoke at the um, disclosure conference in December, they talked about the lag in uh, availability of financial statement information to investors and suggested make interim reporting more frequently than annual would be useful. So. Um, do you remember which states or st state or states do more frequent than annual? And can you say anything about uh, what, um, that, what that involves? Uh, Tennessee does for sure. There may be others as well. And I think that they might only do it in certain cases. So that would be another way to, instead of requiring everybody to report qu quarterly, you know, maybe if you're only if you're, you know, if you're, I, I think in their case, it's, it's only if you issue debt, but they're um, really- Which annual, would be why, we, why investors would care about it. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, thank Thanks. you, Adrian. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have our, our final speaker, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, Marcus had another meeting uh, this morning, so we got a little tied up. Um, Marcus is. Um, um, I do not have a bio for That's you. That's okay. I can, I can take care of it. <laughs> Marcus Stanley is policy director of Americans for Financial Reform. And he's going to talk to us today about municipal bond market reg regulation implications for transparency. All right, so I will uh, I will try to be quick since I know you guys have been through uh, uh, quite uh, quite an event, and uh, I'm sorry for for being late. I got unavoidably called into a, a meeting on Capitol Hill. Um, so I'm I'm not quite sure I'm going to live up to the uh, the billing of. Uh, of my title there, which is uh, which is very broad, uh, but what I'm going to try to do is explain uh, what we do at Americans for Financial Reform as a public interest organization, and talk about how that our interest as a public interest organization intersect with the, uh, I guess what you could call the data and disclosure uh, community, and then also sort of hone in on the municipal market and talk about some of the issues I see in terms of uh, regulation of the municipal market that we've been engaged in and how better disclosure and data can, uh, can help address those. Uh, so Americans Financial Reform is a coalition of over 200 organizations put together uh, in 2009, just in the wake of the financial crisis when I think the uh, community, public interest community, labor community, um, other organizations realized that we can no longer ignore how the, the details of how the financial system is run, that all of us, that the public in general has an enormous stake in, uh, in financial stability and in, uh, in financial practices that might once have seen just technical things that were just the province of experts. Um, so uh, we have been, we are very active in commenting on legislation, regulation, uh, and uh, and rules, and I think there's sort of a natural intersection between the public interest community and data and disclosure. And we have uh, actually worked with the Data Coalition to defend uh, legal requirements for disclosure and for better disclosure uh, many times because uh, public interest organizations are where we're not necessarily that well funded. We can't necessarily go out and get. We don't generate the data. We're trying to monitor the practices of very large organizations like uh, banks and broker dealers uh, who are doing very information intensive practices. And we really are reliant on uh, disclosure and uh, to understand what's going on and also on data intermediaries. I think it's really been great that, that for-profit data intermediaries have, have emerged to translate this kind of data for the public. And that's, that's very helpful for us. And it's also a point we frequently made to regulators. The SEC has had this push 
uh, for years now. I'm more familiar with it in the corporate space than the muni space, but I bet it operates in the muni space some too, uh, to say that disclosures have to be simplified and trimmed back and that organizations have disclosed too much and disclosed too much technical information. And one point we always make is, look, this is the age of computers. If, uh, if issuers and entities disclose a lot of data, there's going to be somebody out there to translate that into English uh, for regular investors and for public interest groups so that we can understand that. And more data is better in the era of computers. It's not confusing, it's better. Um, so, so that's something that, that we have, uh, have always pressed. Uh, now, in terms of the, the muni market in uh, particular, uh, I think there, there are sort of two streams of reform in the muni market. And what one is sort of focused on investors and, and has to do with EMMA and, and issuer disclosure and, and basically saying, uh, we, we need to better understand, you know, we have this enormous variety of, of municipal um, debt instruments out there and we need, uh, investors need to better understand uh, the condition of the issuer and the, the, the nature of the, the instrument itself uh, for investors. And, and that is frankly something uh, probably a lot of you guys are involved in. We have not been as involved in, in part because it's kind of bipartisan. There's, there's a big push behind it. It's a pretty bipartisan effort. Uh, frankly, muni investors, because tax-free, tend to be higher income people and our constituencies that we focus on most tend to be lower income in a lot of cases. And, and we, we just didn't feel we were as needed in, in that area, though it's, it's, it's something that we favor. But the, the, the thing where we've really been focused on, and I think in part because of our origins of the financial crisis, is the uh, protection of issuers. Uh, and issuers really uh, were hit very hard in the, uh, the financial crisis in, in multiple ways. Uh, there was some discussion earlier about the uh, the collapse of the muni bond insurers, uh, and that that really had an impact in terms of, of just municipalities' uh, ability to borrow. Uh, the collapse of the auction rate securities market that imposed all these penalty rates on municipalities, and uh, also municipal swaps and derivatives uh, related to that. A lot of those came out of the auction rate securities market. Some of them were forms of hedging on on uh, <clears throat> interest rates were sold as, as forms of hedging on interest rates to municipalities. And those, those deals ended up going upside down in very dramatic ways, costing issuers enormous amounts. Um, and also a, a lot of things just came out, I think weren't necessarily about the financial crisis, but uh, Mark, Kim Cornaggi, who just left, has done some good work on this. Mark, Mark has too about how, uh, Municipal issuers are just disadvantaged in the system. They get they get lower bond ratings for the same probability of default. Um, they have to pay higher fees often. Um, so we really um, had that focus kind of on issuer protection. And there were a lot of things in Dodd Frank that were intended to protect the issuers uh, and were inspired by. Uh, really, issuers getting ripped off by dealers in, in multiple ways, the most extreme example being these, these derivatives deals, which were really extremely harmful. Um, and these were sold as saving money, and the risks were not really well presented to people at all. So uh, a number of things came out of, uh, of, of Dodd-Frank uh, to protect issuers. And one of these was uh, the idea that if you provided advice to an issuer, uh, you would have a fiduciary duty to that issuer. So you'd be responsible for the, uh, the quality of that advice. Um, and that the people selling complex instruments like derivatives and swaps would have that fiduciary duty. Uh, another thing uh, that came out was a big change in the municipal securities. Uh, or And I should mention with fiduciary duty, the, the new requirement, the, the new category of municipal advisor. So, so we now have these municipal advisors who it's their business to give advice to municipalities and, they have a fiduciary duty. Um, the changes in the MSRB, the, the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board is supposed to have half independent members now and it has, now has a specific mandate to protect issuers. Uh, and also changes in uh, the ratings agencies, including universal ratings. The idea that we're supposed to consistently rate different kinds of bonds according to their 
default probabilities and also other protections that ratings agencies are supposed to be better, better run now. Um, and we have been engaged in lobbying for and, and, and uh, commenting on these, these different areas. And I have to say that, um, ah, Kim, Kim Fornaggio is back. I, I, I name checked you. So. Okay. <laughs> well, we, we have made great use of your work on the discrepancies and ratings of, of muni bonds and, uh, and other kinds of, of investment grade bonds. So uh, thank you for that. But uh, I would say that most of the um, most of these reforms have either not been implemented or not been well implemented from from our perspective. Um, the um, the fiduciary duties uh, that are supposed to be owed to municipalities now, uh, yes, if you're a registered municipal advisor, you owe that fiduciary duty. But if you're a dealer selling a complex product to a municipality, you can actually continue to provide advice to that municipality about the wonders of your product. And as long as the municipality has a separate municipal advisor who has a fiduciary duty, the dealer who's selling and the dealer who provides advice will not necessarily have a fiduciary duty. So that, that's really, uh, we believe, an, an issue. And there are supposed to be uh, fiduciary duties specifically tied to swaps, and there are many ways to get out of that as well. So we felt that didn't go far enough. Uh, the universal ratings for ratings agencies and the ratings agency reforms, we just feel have been uh, very inadequate. I mean, I mean, the, the clear intent of Section 938A of Dodd-Frank um, was to say that uh, when you provide, when, when you give a, uh, a, a rating, the same rating to two different kinds of bonds, that should correspond to a similar probability of default. And you should have to sort of stake out in advance your belief about these probabilities of default. And the SEC has really permitted ratings agencies to get around this simply by coming up with different symbols and saying, ah, well, this is a, a little AAA and this is a big AAA and they, they mean different things. And, uh, you, you know, um, and we, we, were, we really had high hopes for the idea of tying the probability of default to a rating, not just uh, because it would create consistency, but also because it would create uh, ex post accountability in case we saw a collapse of ratings in a particular asset class that you could point to these these default probabilities did not happen, uh, did not come through as promised. And, and we've asked the SEC to impose penalties when default, you, you know, when when actual performance diverges widely from predicted default and they have not been hospitable to that idea. Um, and there's there's many things I could say about the problems with the, the ratings agency uh, reforms. And we're hoping now that we have a democratic house to get a, a little bit more, more motion on that. And with the MSRB, uh, you know, the MSRB is now supposed to have more independent members uh, that are not tied to regulated entities or issuers. And we, uh, have been pressing to get applications from people who would qualify as independent members. And I have to say, it's it's been very hard to crack that sort of insider monopoly at the MSRB. Uh, it's, it's really traditionally been kind of the terrain of the, the market insiders of, of, of various types. And the MSRB just failed horribly to look ahead and see the risks of these instruments before uh, the crisis, and they they have access to a tremendous amount of data, and we believe they should be trying to look over the horizon and identify emerging risks uh, for issuers. And and we just their process of selecting people for the MSRB has not seemed to prioritize getting people who would be good at that. In fact, it seemed to prioritize getting people who would maybe not want to talk about those risks because they might continue to have a financial interest. So we are continuing to press on all these things uh, and uh, also continuing to press for better disclosure and, uh, and better data. So uh, glad to take any questions. Do we have questions from Marcus? Here. Uh, I was speaking of Dodd-Frank and part of Dodd-Frank um, was to get independent funding for the governmental accounting standards board. Do you know anything about that or how that got in that bill? Uh, that's a good question. No, that, that's really not something that we have uh, 
that's that's been an issue that we've tackled. It's an 800 page bill, so whenever I present myself to the Dr. Frank expert, I always change the list. Any other questions? I know it's the end of the day, so we're going to have to Thank you very much, Mark. That was really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today and for sticking through to the end. Um, we are now, uh, this is the close of the forum and we are now going to have a, a meeting of the state and local working group. So for those of you, we, we have lunch for, I think we have lunch for probably about 30, 30 people. Yeah. Um, so if you want to stick around, everybody's welcome to, to stick around and, and listen in and, and get involved too. So we'll take a little break now while we get to some meeting. Thank you so much. This is very thank you. It's really probably able to listen to now. Yeah, so I'm, I'm basically retired. It's only 25 years. Uh, I do some independent consulting. So it's just nice to keep up with the industry. Yeah. You're always in the media. Yeah, so I was first an analyst and then I was creating a credit risk. Do you know what I love? Not too much. Not too much. Yeah, you know, you work, you know, same industry. Oh, you know, it's like the inability to talk to you. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Like, if I met you, like, you're busy. You're busy. You're busy. You're busy. Yeah. You couldn't say, like, what are you guys thinking? Well, now you're sitting right in. Yeah. You just, we're so really you just to get it because it might have been. Yeah. That was great. I know. I'm just really, I'm sharing my screen here. Anyway, thanks. thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Okay. okay, I've got your contact information and you know, we will need more subject matter experts as we continue developing this. So, thank you. Great, thank you.